um, I mean, as, as we are going to record the sessions, uh, uh, share my screen. We are uh, around 80 people now. Uh, we start also recording this. So please, the, the team at Media Lab, oh, I think we are already doing it. So, okay, uh, don't worry, we will edit the, the video. Um, uh, and yeah, so let's, let's uh, start. Yes, one second. Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning. Good morning to, to all, all, all our friends in this Arcus Alliance that, this, that uh, decided to be here this morning with, with us to share uh, ideas, to share uh, projects on uh, citizen science. I think this is a very encouraging project that we all have that uh, we have been preparing for, uh, for some months. Um, and it's going to be a um, I think a milestone you know, in the in the in the works that we are doing in preparing uh, our position paper on citizen science, and mainly on creating new uh, links uh, with the different uh, actors in this alliance, and also with other people that decided to join us this morning to learn about citizen science and about the different projects that our different universities are doing. Uh, let me share um, the screen to explain you about the structure of the session. So, yes, one second. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. We decided to call this this uh, event "Co-creating Citizen Science." Uh, it's going to last for around four hours. Uh, it's important that that you stay uh, all this time because it's going to be a participatory uh, event, a participatory workshop. The idea is that uh, we learn about the different activities that uh, has been done, that are been doing, you know, that we are doing in the in the Arcus Alliance in our different universities, but at the same time to reflect, to discuss, you know, uh, our ideas on citizen science. So here you have the, the structure of the session. Uh, we have just start this morning with a presentation by me and also now by my colleague Hildrum. Uh, then we'll have a, a presentation by Florence. And then I will also present the different uh, work on, on participation uh, that we do at the Media Lab. And then we will start with these micro presentations. Um, and after the break, as I already uh, said, we will have these breakout sessions, these living lab sessions, where we will be able to, uh, to meet other uh, colleagues uh, in, this, in this event this morning in order to discuss some of the main topics that we have uh, identified you know, as um, important for our uh, work in preparing um, this uh, position paper of the Arcus Alliance uh, on citizen science. Uh, some of the, of the projects that you will uh, see today uh, are already, uh, have already information in this uh, network, network that we, we had prepared. It's called no, uh, Nometrics Network and the idea is to share uh, different projects and, and uh, different profiles of people involved on this kind of uh, science um, among the Arcus Alliance. So in case that uh, as a speaker you didn't uh, do it so far, uh, we encourage you to, to, to do it, to create your own profile and to share the project that you're going to present this morning. Um, if not, uh, please just send us a kind of summary of the project and we will do it for you in a way that we can send a, a list of the different projects to all the participants this morning. And about the instructions, as I uh, already uh, said before, I think it's important that uh, we all have our micros and cameras uh, mute. Uh, we have the chat as a way to, uh, to communicate to, to each other. It's important to know that the different speakers will be contacted by the team 
uh, of uh, Media Lab uh, through the chat. So please, we will follow the order in the program. Uh, it's important that um, uh, you pay attention just yes, when, 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 when is the time of your uh, participation, because we will invite you to reactivate your micro. Um, um, yeah, so you will be able to do the presentation. Those presentations are just four minutes uh, long. The idea is that we are able to, 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 to have a, a good mapping of what's going on in this uh, Arcus Alliance. So uh, we will have time to go deeper into, this, into those projects later on. Um, apart from that, please also use your full name in Zoom because this is going to, this is going to be very important for the certificates, for those that stay with us for the entire session, and also uh, to, to, to search the, 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 the speakers uh, in order to reactivate their micros when, when it's the, their time to do the presentations. Um, finally, uh, we are very happy to, to be with, with you this, this morning. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for us at the Arcus Alliance to, to meet each other. And I hope to be the, the first of many other ways of engaging and, and creating not only a stronger universities, but also a stronger Europe. And, 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 and to have also a, a more, a, a more uh, democracy you know, in our continent that is important in these difficult times that we are uh, having at this moment. So uh, thank you very much. Um, Hildrum is your, is your time. So uh, please, I don't know if your micro is already activated. Uh, yeah, okay, now it should be. Uh, so. so hello everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, can you see my screen as well? Yeah, we can see your because screen. Not, not your cam, if you want to activate it, but uh, oh. your screen, we can see oh. it. <laughs> okay, so now the camera is on as well. So uh, hello also from my side, a very hearty welcome. I'm Hildrun Walter from University of Graz, and I'm scientist or uh, researcher in science communication. And today I have the honor to present you the Arches Alliance and the role of open science and citizen science within our alliance in a very few words. So um, I switch. So uh, I hope you can follow my presentation. So um, Ar the Arches is a European University Alliance and uh, Exists, um, there exist seven um, universities within our alliance. So it's from Bergen, Vilnius, Leipzig, Graz, Padova, Lyon, and Granada. And um, yeah, we have a huge network since uh, there are more than 300,000 uh, students within our alliance, more than 24,000 uh, academics, and more than 17,000 uh, technical staff members. And um, the University uh, Alliance is organized in several action lines. And I will very shortly uh, present those action lines since they give a good overview uh, for our event as well, since it's some kind of uh, guideline like um, engaged European citizens. So I'm very happy that we have several citizens joining us today. Thank you and uh, very welcome from this side also to have you here. Um, Student-centered frameworks for quality learning. We have some students here as well. Multilingual and multicultural university. I'm very happy that we have um, speakers from all universities. Um, widening access, inclusion and diversity. Um, entrepreneurial university and regional engagement. Uh, this is also very important that we have the connects to our regions and uh, make possible engagement for uh, local stakeholders. This will be a topic today as well. Research support and early stage researcher development here. Our openness task force uh, 
is member of and coordination and management and dissemination. Uh, this is by Granada and also today our event was organized by Granada and the Arcus Academy Week from the University of Vilnius. So thank you all also for organization. <clears throat> I want just to read out some words of the enabling strategies of the Arcus European University Alliance, since it's also connected to our topic today. So people-centered, a laboratory for institutional learning, mobility and recognition, jointness and participation, openness and sustainability. And um, yeah, I, I'm here on behalf of our openness task force. So uh, we are in charge of uh, creating a position paper on open science and citizen science uh, that will be presented next year at the final conference. And we are working on aims and measures for our alliance regarding uh, open science and citizen science in order also to, to support uh, to, to get to our vision and mission of Arcus uh, Alliance. And uh, this is unfortunately not the whole task force. So we have very many hardworking people here, but uh, it gives you an impression and some faces in this time of uh, a digital conference. And um, yeah, thank you for, for being with us in this task force. <clears throat> So uh, just to give some words about open science and citizen science, since uh, this is important today as our topic. So um, we defined open science as an overarching concept, a set of good practices, principles, and goals with the aim to reduce barriers in all aspects of science. It stands for transparency, reproducibility, comprehensiveness, open access, trustworthiness, participation, inclusiveness in all parts of the scientific process. So um, open science therefore also enables transdisciplinary collaborative research. And uh, the major topics we work on are open, sex, uh, open access, open data, open source and open notebooks, like for example, open lab notebooks. Uh, we discuss open educa educational resources as well open evaluation, peer review, open research assessment. And uh, for today, very important citizen science, open research agenda setting and stakeholder engagement as open science principles. Regarding citizen science, um, it is a very broad term. This is from the European Commission uh, lender definition. Um, covering that part of open science in which citizens can participate in the scientific research process in different possible ways. So they can uh, engage as observers, as funders, but also in analyzing data in providing data, but also uh, further in evaluation in research agenda setting and um, dissemination processes as well. So um, this allows for the democratization of science and is linked to stakeholder engagement and public participation. So um, we are very happy to come in together today. And yeah, our objectives for co-creation is to get um, multiple perspectives on our topics of citizen science today, uh, gaining insight into the expertise and needs from different stakeholders. So I'm happy that we have students, that we have researchers, that we have citizens here as well, gathering knowledge and ideas during creative process. This will be our living labs and generating a common strategy shaping citizen science in, on, in our Arcus European University Alliance. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy that I may introduce Florence Bellin from University the, of Lyon. <laughs> and she is uh, director of uh, culture society uh, at the University of Lyon. And she will talk about citizen science and different models of science shops. So thank you. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Can you see my uh, slide? My presentation? Yes. 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 Not in the presentation mode yet. Okay, that's fine. So, so hello everyone. Thank you to 
I'm very happy to be here and congratulations for the organization in this bizarre context. Okay, so I would like to speak about you with you about our science shop at the University of Lyon. But if you are okay with that, I would like to have maybe a more general uh, presentation uh, and to speak about it before uh, seeing how it works, how science shops like ours works. So what can we say about uh, citizen science at the university? Uh, I just would like to, to say that uh, it's more- Florent, uh, yeah? just ask you, in okay, case that you, got, you can get into the presentation mode in your uh, PowerPoint, it will be easier to see the screen. I'm sorry. Just to to do uh, to get into the presentation mode in in your uh, PowerPoint, uh, so it will be easier for for us to see the to see the slides. Ah, okay, okay, like that. Okay, great, great. Okay, that's fine. Okay, okay, like that. Okay. So what we can see is that. Uh, it's not now like original that you will have a citizen science tool inside a university. More and more universities are engaged in citizen science. And there's different way of doing it. Science Shop is one model. Media Lab in Granada is another model. You will have different tools, but more and more. Um, our specificity for our science shop is that we are employing students in this process, in this relationship between science and uh, society. Where our science shop is now experimented now for seven years, so we can uh, share with you with some conclusion. Why citizen science is more than ever important in our institution? I don't know if you notice it in your country, what we see in France, but I think you, at the European scale, it's the same. You have a mistrust against science and at the same time, a kind of trust. What we observe, we observe a mistrust against politicians, against media, and the science institution and researcher have still a trust towards the society. But we have to be careful and the crisis that we live show that the, the language, the speech of sciences, of researchers are very important, but can be confused for the people. It's a policy, politic program, in a way, citizen science. It's to see the society not only as a market, but also as humanities. Maybe we'll speak about that later. Big crisis climate change, pandemic, and so on, that see that the universities are not to focus only on big science, international ranking, high level publication, but our universities has to take care to the crown science, to the people. We, this connection is necessary now. Also, what we see is that the digital world permits more connection with people. For example, to collect data for the citizen science, our digital tools help that in that way. So to remind you, citizen science has to do with RRI. RRI, it was a concept promoted by the European uh, Commission, which was very interesting, to say that in, RRIs or citizen science implies that societal actors in their diversity, researchers, citizens, policy makers, business, third sex sector organizations have to work together during the entire research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with the values, the needs, and the expectations of society. So what is very important in our tools, in a science shop, but not only, is that we take care, we pay attention to the values, which has something to do with ethics, but also 
the needs and the expectations of society. And the pandemic, the crisis that we are living in, show us that it's important to, to pay attention how it works in the, at the hospital. We don't have the doctor to have only very high level publication, but also to be able to help people in this crisis. So we see like two different research area, a demand driven research. So research follows social, economical, or political demands, or uh, it's important as well. I'm not fighting them all together, but saying it's complementary to a research which follows interests. Practical adaptations follow the generation of knowledge. One is continuing increasing knowledge, but it's important that another science, another research, respond to the needs and the expectations of society. To remind you, and we used to work for another European project that I found very interesting, and you can find all the resources online. It was a project nucleus showing that, okay, university in one territory is working with another cells which are media, public policy, public engagement actors, economy, and civil society. And maybe the citizen science, it's a good way to work with citizens, but not only, also with another actors from a, an ecosystem, from a territory. And all of us are responsible in a way. Okay, so let me see about, let me focus about science shops. When we say boutique de science or science shop. Hello. Science shops is not a shop. We don't buy, we don't sell anything in our science shop. We are, this is small identities that carry out scientific research with a wide range of disciplines, usually free of charge. And on behalf of citizens and local civil society. The fact that science shops respond to civil society needs for expertise and knowledge, which is a key element that distinguishes them from other knowledge transfer mechanisms. Which is very important is that, okay, we listen to people, to any organization, they express the demand on expertise, like, for example, a business model, impact study, juridical expertise, anything, a lot of things. And we organize at the university to respond to their demand. And which is very important is that a science shop provides independent participatory research support in response to concerns experienced by civil society. But it's an independent. Um, research. Science shops is not new. There is a lot of all over the, the, the world. There is a very interesting network at the European uh, scale, which is called Living Knowledge. Uh, and I would like to insist about the fact on the fact that prestigious universities like Cambridge like Edinburgh, like Amsterdam, like Dublin, has developed their own science shop. Some of them are maybe focused on one thematic, for example, psychology discipline, or another discipline, or some or another, like ours, are multidisciplines, or they are different models, but it's interesting that now for a well-known university, it's important to be part of this dynamic. And I think for our universities, it will be a mistake not to take this dynamic seriously. There is a lot of European projects. We have supported science shops 
tea shops inspires and which Perares. And we can thank the European Commission to have supported this kind of tools. So, just more practical aspect, our science shops, how it works. How the role of the science shops is to gather the needs, to get in contact with the social, uh, civil society, the communities, or I don't know, or some people, some specific people. So we get to take in contact with them and we help them to express the demand. Sometimes for them, it, for NGOs, it's not so easy to say, okay, maybe we, we know that we need some help here at this point. Maybe, for example, the business model. We are lost. We don't know how to do it. But we don't know how we can express it. And the role of the science shops staff is to make them in the um, tranquility. Okay, I say, okay, we are going to help you to formalize your demand to formalize your question. And this time of communication, mediation, it's very important for the university because that shows to this, to the civil society, that university can take time for them as well and pay attention to their need. Okay, so after that, we gather the different needs. With that, we select the subjects, because we cannot respond to all of the subjects, of course, thanks to a scientific committee. We build a team. So for us, a team at Science Shop of Lyon is a student, a researcher, which, which will, will supervise the student, and the civil society. We finance the studies. Maybe we will speak about that in some questions. We follow the collaborations huh? because we put all of these people, different people together. So we help them in their way of working. And after that, our role is also to disseminate the results, to put them in the media, for example, to put them to the policy makers. Remember the different cells that I spoke together a few minutes ago? We, we help them to uh, valorize these results. Okay, so what the role of the civil society? To submit their questions. They participate to build the shared knowledge. It's very important. It's a collaborative process. The citizens are engaged in collecting data, in interpreting them, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's a partnership, it's not a command. It's not, okay, we just need an exper expertise, that's enough. No, we will work all together, which is very important. That means that in a way, we also disseminate the science methodology. You will have a question after that, a problematic, what are our hypotheses? How can we collect data? the focus group methodology, and uh, I don't know. And after that, how can we interpret them the more objectively? So it's important. And after the civil society, it's in, in engaging, of course, in disseminating the results. What the role of the students carry out a study through, for us, internship or group projects, it depends and build a shared knowledge. So for the student, it's very important because thanks to this experimentation, he will be in contact with the real world. He's leaving the university and the classroom and uh, to, think in, uh, to think about society in a theoretical way, but now it's in the real world. And what about the researcher and research professors? Their role is to mentor students, to say, okay, go and do some uh, literacy heart, state of heart, and uh, use this methodology and so on. Of course, researchers build also to share knowledge. And for them, it's a good way for innovating 
in their own research. Because for a researcher, it's very interesting to say, oh, maybe, okay, we were focusing about uh, artificial intelligence or climate change, but maybe in my neighborhood, we will have this kind of question. And maybe as a uh, psychologic, as a sociologic or physics sometimes, I have to take care of about it. Okay, how many minutes do, do I have left? Uh, well, I think it should be like uh, one, two more minutes. <laughs> okay. okay. But uh, do you want, okay. I mean, take uh, three, four more, don't worry. It's okay, I, mean, it's okay. I try to be more brief, uh, okay. briefer. Okay. So that's a model. That's a model. But you will have, you could have different models. What is very interesting for me with science shops is to make the contact with the society thanks to students' work. And we will have um, uh, this afternoon or this morning, some of our students and researchers, we can uh, present their own experience. Because I think that students is a good link between researchers, which are very busy with their publication and uh, concurrence and so on, and with the society. Because in this way, we are training our students to become a good citizen. Citizen engage and also pay attention to the society, not only to their own career. Okay, so just how it works. You will have the slides later. The wall of the scientific committee, where, where you can find researchers, but also students and of course NGOs. The, the work of the team. And also, which is very important, is that we organize some training for the students, but also for the researchers and the, the civil society representatives. Okay, how can we speak together? How, what, what is your social demand? And also, how can we work together? Because it's not so easy. Sometimes you, you could have some conflict because for example, the CSO would like to have this kind of conclusion and the study leads you to another conclusion. So, you know, it's a real situation. And ask the question of the role of the scientist in the society. Okay, and you will have different, uh, different uh, subjects, like, for example, how better understand obstacles for cycling, in a town, how can we manage the, the presence of cars and uh, cycling? For example, with a neighbor council, how to make planning documents accessible to local inhabitants and citizens. Another project is, for example, about accommodation, how supporting new forms, alternative for seniors residents, and another subject completely different, for example, the spread of an invasive plant inside, how can we help them? Okay, so you, will, you can see the variety, the diversity as a subject. So thank you for your attention. And now it's time for Esteban to present us our, your, their wonderful media lab in, at the University of Granada. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Florence. Uh, really interesting for us. Uh, I think we share some of, I mean, we share many of the ideas that you have just explained, uh, but also we have maybe some sli slightly different perspectives on, on this issue. So I think it's very interesting that we can uh, complement you know, our different uh, uh, work. So yes, let me share uh, my screen. Um, I will try to to explain br briefly uh, how we conceive ourselves, uh, what we are, what we do. Um, maybe uh, to show you a, a model that is is more focused in this case in participation, participatory science. Uh, 
social innovation uh, and in trying to reconnect science in general with the society, and um, particularly also uh, the social sciences, uh, social, social science and humanities. So in our case, the, the Media Lab um, is the short name for Research Laboratory for Digital Culture and Society. Um, basically, this is, this is our website. So we really invite you to, to check the different projects that we have. Uh, it was uh, founded in 2015. And since then, we have developed uh, many different projects that basically uh, have something in common that uh, is uh, participation and innovation in different ways. Social innovation, public innovation, civic innovation. Uh, and as I will uh, tell you uh, later on, the different projects that we have are somehow addressing those, um, those types of uh, ways of engaging with the uh, citizens and also to innovate in our society. Apart from that, from the research point of view, uh, we work in three main areas, uh, digital society, digital humanities, and digital, digital science. So basically, why we talk about labs? Uh, why a social lab or a social innovation lab? Basically, because we think that we need to, um, to uh, let's say, to adopt this idea of the uh, lab in, 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 in the hard science uh, into the uh, social science and into the humanities and into the social uh, and the social dimension you know, where we are thinking with with uh, our colleagues we are thinking with the society so we need to think together we need to do experimentation to prototype uh, to combine reflection but also very important for us uh, orientation to action uh, to, to to work creating communities to work in a very flexible uh, an agile way, and also to address uh, local topics, but at the same time, uh, global uh, topics, no? in order to, to, to give responses from the, uh, from the university to the complex challenges that we are facing. So for us, the social context that we are living is basically uncer uh, uncertainty you know, in this moment, uh, particularly in this pandemic time that we are living, but just before this time, I think that somehow the contest uh, were uh, very similar in, 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 in this regard. And also the need to strengthen democracy uh, through participation and through, um, um, let's say, to make our institutional uh, approaches stronger. Um, the, the, the need for creating connections between, between um, among, among multiple dimensions, you know, the, phys the physical, the digital, hybrid approaches to reality. Uh, this was something very important for us before the pandemic. So uh, during the pandemic, what we found uh, was the opportunity to scale many projects into the international, uh, into an international dimension and also to engage with other universities and with other institutions. No? Um, and, and also it's very important for us to try to combine the multiple forms of intelligence that we have. And, uh, and very important to, to keep, to, 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 to take care of, of each other no? in, in our team and in our communities. Laboratories in this sense, uh, can be, uh, could be uh, understood as a kind of institutions like uh, ours within a university. But here in Spain, also we have identified uh, labs in regional governments, uh, in local governments, um, and very different type of labs uh, from citizen laboratories or civic laboratories to government laboratories, living labs, and also other labs that are related to the digital transformation, like fab labs, maker spaces, media labs, etc. Apart from that, usually we use the term lab when, when we talk about projects, you know, like for example, in the last part of this morning, we will talk in a kind of lab format just for one hour, but the idea is to somehow replicate these values that I told you in this small scale. You know? And also, basically, the lab is an attitude, a, a methodology, a philosophy that we apply to different parts in, 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 our, in our life, in our activities. 
So the different values that we have, apart from some of uh, those that I already mentioned, is digital culture is very important for us. We don't understand creating projects without this uh, approach of digital culture. And also um, a lab as a way of learning, way of learning about the process and also about the results that we get, you know? but basically we are in academic institutions and learning is, is something really important and it's a way to improve the work we do. Um, documenting the process is very important for us because it's the way of learning that we have and also we try to promote to foster cooperation versus the idea of competition or to combine both, uh, both of them from a, a perspective that is inclusive and also very uh, diverse. No? So I just wanted to, to mention the, the people. Uh, this is just some of the people that today we have in the team of Media Lab taking care of the, of the event. But as you can see in the timeline, uh, we have a very a fluid model of, uh, let's say, um, belonging to the, to, the, to the Media Lab. Um, and those are some examples of participatory projects. I'm going to be just very, very brief to explain how we understand participation in these different projects that um, sometimes are more focused on, on, on research, on traditional, traditional research, and uh, um, sometimes also are focused in a kind of dissemination the activities that we already do and to take then to the people and also to other institutions. So Facultad Cero, for example, was an, an opportunity uh, to engage with other universities in Spain and also in Latin America during this time of pandemic. Basically what we created was a, a space for sharing the, um, let's say the radical transformation, re digital transformation that we suffer as uh, professors, are. Uh, 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 as a student and to share our learning with other people and with other universities. So it was basically a kind of bottom uh, up approach um, and also a participatory approach to, to, to I mean, to, to share you know, uh, our uh, knowledge during this time. So here you have some of the universities that participated here and some of the activities that were based on, on conferences, um, um, like uh, similar to the one that we had this morning, you know, what we, when, where we were presenting many uh, different initiatives and, and learning that we had during this time. Also engaging students, you know, here, for example, we have we had 12 students from different universities talking about their experiences uh, on the pandemic um, and uh, different workshops and, and different laboratories that we also organized within this uh, project of Faculta Zero. Something very important for us, when we want to engage with uh, people, it's very important that we use the digital language of our time. So if we create digital identities, we create uh, uh, also different profiles in different media and we try to keep a strategy on communication. So this is another example, it's called uh, Lavin Granada. This is a laboratory of innovation of Granada. This was a proposal that we uh, did to, the, to, to our region, to our city, uh, in order to share ideas uh, to improve uh, the city, to improve uh, the policies that we have uh, here. So it was a way to collaborate with the local and the, and the, and the regional government, and also to empower, to activate people uh, to, uh, let's say, to be curious, to, be, uh, to pay attention to the best things that were happening on, the, on, on different parts of the world, and to bring them into Granada in order to, to, to change what we are, and not only to sell where we are, no? Um, so basically this is part of the, of the platform where you can see some of the ideas that were shared. Um, and this is a great way to uh, detect um, scientific challenges and also to engage students with, um, with the different uh, realities that we have around us. And also very important for us in all the projects is uh, the, the geocalization of, of the idea, the geocalization of the projects, of the processes, you know, in order to have a map, to map what we, what, what's going on. Something that we did also during the pandemic was to transform this project into a, a UGR in casa. No? This is a, the university at home. And a, instead of ideas for changing Granada, we share ideas for a, spending our time during the lockdown 
and also uh, to share experiences during uh, that time. Another example, in, and in, in this case, is a, a way of engaging uh, people at a regional level uh, in, in topics like participation and democratic innovation. No? So this is uh, also a proposal of the university, and here we are talking, we, we are working on this on this um, on these topics. Also with a with a platform uh, that you can visit is Laboratory Seven One Seven, and here we are mapping uh, the participation that it's going on in our in our region, uh, the different agents that we have here working on these topics. And here is the map with the activities uh, where we live. And this is a very important project that I think that uh, connects very well uh, with what uh, Florence uh, just uh, explained before. Uh, universities for public innovation. I think this is, this is um, an strategic project that we have at the University of, of Granada. I hope that it can be also at the Arcus Alliance level. Um, it's a network that we are building in the Latin America um, contest and in the Spanish and Portuguese contest. Basically, what we are trying is to promote public innovation from the universities. And this, is, this combines just uh, the model that Florence uh, explained before uh, about uh, um, science shops, but also have uh, another uh, important, important, important actor in the, um, in the, um, in the equation, and this is the public sector. We believe that universities need to um, do a systematic transfer of knowledge into the public sector, because this is the way to uh, achieve uh, the Agenda 2030 goals, the sustainable, sustainable goals the, 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 that we have, um, and it's a way to improve society uh, as a whole. So uh, public innovation is very important for us, we have a website where you can see more information. We have also a manifesto on this, and it's very much connected with the idea of citizen science. Um, just to conclude, I also would like to, to tell you that as part of our idea of engaging, uh, we develop the, the digital radio of the University of, of Granada, and this is a great way to engage not only within our university and, 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 the, and, the, and the region, but also I think it can be a, a, a great format within the Arcus Alliance. No? So uh, students and, and, and citizens in general come to the university to, uh, to talk no? and, to, and to share ideas. No? And this is very important. Here are some, some examples of this. Um, and basically I would like just to finish uh, back to the labs, to the to the labs idea. So uh, regularly, what we do is to 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 create a call for a uh, labs of social innovation. Uh, the last call uh, took place at the end of 2020. It was just uh, virtual, and we had more than 400 people participating from more than 15 countries. Uh, that generated uh, around 30 30 different projects projects that sometimes can be uh, later on a research project or a, um, a teaching a, a innovation project or just a, yes, a kind of a citizen initiative. So those are some of our values and the way we understand participation and we understand uh, uh, this, let's say, perspective on, on, on citizen science from a very a, let's say social uh, approach and also digital approach uh, in, 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 in our time. So thank you very much with this image uh, of uh, better times where, where we could meet. So I hope we can do it next year at least. Um, and that's all. So thank you. Um, and let me just introduce my, my colleagues at Media Lab that uh, are going to start calling the different uh, speakers uh, for the next uh, uh, part of this uh, morning. So Edu, I don't know if you are there. Yes, Stefan, I'm here. Okay, so yes, uh, go ahead and we'll continue with the program. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Adrian, and these are my colleagues from Media Lab, Sandra and Alejandro. Hi. Uh, we're going to start with the micro presentations of the different projects. Uh, I 
suggest you please pay attention to the to the chat and remember that in order to get your certificate of participation in this event you need to send a private message through the zoom channel to sonia in arcus so please do it whenever you can and you're going to have about four minutes per presentation uh, if you see that we the colleagues from media lab turn on our cameras, that means you should be finishing. Okay. And Okay, the first presentation is that of Alberto Barause, University of Padua. Uh, Alberto, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, no problem. Can you? Yes, okay. I'm ready when you want. <clears throat> you can go ahead. So I'll share my screen. Yeah. So we can see it. Good. So um, today I will tell you briefly about the crucial role of fishers and other stakeholders. Actually, I will only speak about fishers because of time reasons in the conservation of salt marshes in the Lagoon of Venice. So salt marshes are not just this grassy island that they seem like, but they are a very rare and delicate habitat of the lagoon where Venice is located in the middle of this lagoon. And these rare and beautiful habitats are disappearing at a very fast rate. The surface has decreased by 72% in the past century, mainly due to human causes, for example, due to waves generated by motorboats, as you can see in this picture. And the problem is that these uh, salt marshes are very difficult to access, especially the innermost ones. As you can see in this picture, the water is very shallow. So to protect them, you have to think of novel conservation techniques, which are not um, impacting the same environment you want to protect. Uh, that's why we got funded by the EU, this live conservation project for the Natura 2000 network that ran from 2013 to 2017 and uh, whose goal was to test an integrated approach. By integrated, we mean engineering solution and socioeconomic analysis and stakeholder participation to protect these innermost submerges from erosion. And later, we uh, just signed an interinstitutional agreement with public bodies in charge of Venice Lagoon protection uh, that we run for more five years until 2000, uh, 2025 with the possibility to extend for other five years. So what we have done in Life Women and we are currently doing, first of all, this integrated approach is based on natural-based solutions. We use wood, we use mud to create protections which, which we place on the edges of salt marshes, as you can see in this picture, to protect them from waves. And this integrated approach is based on, is based on prevention and that's why stakeholders are important. These small protections are fragile, but they are widespread. We place them strategically to stop uh, erosion before it accelerates. So we act, we act in a prevention-based uh, approach. And then we have workers doing regular monitoring to increase protection durability and identify any new protection uh, erosion spot that appears and we place protection there as well in a prompt manner. So uh, what's the role of stakeholders in this? We have chosen in the project to hire local workers, in particular fishers from the Lagoon Islands to create these protections, to monitor them, to maintain them uh, regularly. Why that? Because they fish nearby these submerges, these fishers, so they can do the regular monitoring and so they can implement this prevention-based approach they work much more efficiently than anyone else because they know how to navigate in the shallow waters that I was showing you. So they make the approach cost efficient. And by hiring them, by paying them, we create uh, new local jobs. And in the Lagoon of Venice, there's also social erosion. People are leaving the Lagoon because of the Lagoon Islands because of a lack of proper jobs. And by uh, creating this income support tool, we also preserve the cultural heritage represented by the traditional fishing techniques that fishers had carried out for centuries in the Venice Lagoon. And also by making these fishers working on natural conservation, we educate them about the importance of biodiversity. So we paid more than 1,500 person days to these fishers, which is non-negligible because fishers are about 100 
in the northern lagoon. So this was an important input support for them. Uh, the uh, location of these protections was chosen in a, code, in a participatory fashion, so co-design. We went with fishermen to inspect the field and they suggested where to place protections. And in the end of the project, we were very satisfied with the proactivity of fishers. Uh, in the beginning, they were, uh, uh, yeah, um, not so proactive, but in the end, they, it was them who suggested us how to improve those protection, and, it, and this is participation de facto. So we propose that fishers can become stewards of the lagoon landscape. They are not just predators, they are uh, people who can protect the ecosystem, they provide them with ecosystem services fundamental for their income. And this is very important because by involving local communities in conservation, we create feedback between conservation and local development because conservation becomes more efficient because of participation and local development benefits from conservation because we create green jobs in the uh, maintenance of submerges. And this, these feedbacks uh, are important to get to sustainability, of course. Uh, I haven't talked about all the rest of the participatory processes that we carried out in Vimea, for example, in ecotourism or regarding marine litter. If you want to know more, uh, please follow that uh, uh, website link or uh, send me an email. Thank you very much. OK, thanks for your presentation, Alberto. Now we move on to the next one, which is uh, Aleta Bon. Are you there, Aleta? Um, I am there. I'm, I'm not Aleta, I'm Tora, so I will speak on behalf of Aleta. She sends okay. you all many, many greetings, but she is at the NASA conference in the same time. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so we split. Um, yeah, the projects uh, like Alberto ones are super important projects and they need to be really promoted and extended uh, much on a much larger level and that's why uh, currently in Germany we are working on a citizen science strategy a national strategy uh, 2030 for Germany so I will present that strategy but let me talk uh, first about the science barometer that we have every year here in Germany and uh, that shows that almost half of the population is interested in taking part in science projects and is interested in uh, experience how scientists work. And uh, that also resonates in the policy paper of the Ministry of uh, Research in Germany, who highlighted the innovation potential of citizen science. So from 2014 till 2016, an open dialogue on the development of citizen science in Germany was conducted nationwide with over a thousand stakeholders from more than 350 organizations from science, from society and, and policy. And the goal was to develop a green paper citizen science strategy 2020 for Germany with different visions for establishing, for strengthening, for promoting citizen science in Germany. So the green um, paper presents the understanding the needs and the potential of citizen science for Germany along three lines. Uh, what uh, can be strengthening that already exists? Uh, what new things we can create and how we can integrate citizen science into different processes. So the green paper gave uh, 55 options for actions and uh, had also a vision. Um, the, the vision was uh, that by 2020, citizen science would be an integrated part of societal and science-based database. So now um, 2020 was last year and since last year, uh, we are engaged in a, a white paper process. So we move from a green paper to a white paper and we are working with uh, many, many participants from many organizations in a collective co-creative process in order to establish a citizen science strategy 2030 for Germany. So looking 10, 10 years ahead, uh, what are challenges, what are opportunities for anchoring citizen science firmly in Germany? Uh, we established a task force for this white paper. Aleta and me are part of that task force. There are also other institutions uh, part of it. Um, we conducted an online survey uh, over last summer in, this, in the citizen science community in Germany, in Austria, and also in Switzerland. And this became a basis uh, for a um, strategy workshop uh, where we um, designed uh, the citizen science strategy. We wrote a, a first um, draft of the white paper. And uh, now this spring, we are ready to put the white paper uh, online 
for the public consultation to get feedback from the civil society and from every citizens. And then over summer, we will finalize the white paper and uh, we are planning to launch the white paper uh, by the end of, uh, of this year. So there are four topics uh, of focus in the white paper that you can see here. So they're right, right ranging from, from networking and exchange uh, over uh, what is needed in terms of law and ethics. Uh, they're speaking about funding instruments, uh, but also new areas for citizen science like medicine and health or artificial intelligence, etc. So it's really very, very, very broad. Uh, right now, we have almost 100 uh, policy recommendations for actions and that are addressed to practitioners, to civil society, but also to scientists, of course, universities and uh, policy decision makers and funding organizations. So, as I said, uh, now in June, uh, mostly July, we will go into a public consultation process with the white paper to invite uh, all the, the public, all the citizens to, to give us feedback and that feedback will be incorporated to, uh, yeah, to put uh, on this the final draft of the, of the white paper. And uh, I sent you here the, the link. Um, so if you would like to, to contribute, you're, you're very welcome. Your input is uh, very valuable as well. And um, yeah, stay tuned uh, for the white paper, which will hopefully come out by the end of the year. So that is uh, my presentation. And with this, I stop the screen sharing and give back to you. Okay, thank you for your presentation, Aleta. Uh, the next uh, presentation is that of uh, Almudena Ocaña, University of Granada. Almudena, are you there? Okay, I'm here. I want to let you show my screen. Okay, uh, we listen to you. Okay, can you see now? Yes. Okay. Um, hello everyone, I'm Almudeno Caña, Principal Researcher of the Research Group of the University of Granada, ECOFOB. I would like to thank to Arcus and Media Lab for giving us the opportunity to participate in this meeting and to share with you our citizen science initiative, Pedalab UGR. Uh, for a long time, we have observed that is a uh, isn't a real connection between universities and schools. As researchers, we went there, uh, collect the collected the data and publish our research in journals to which teachers normally do not have access. So uh, educational research has a minimal transfer and impact in educational context. In this process, we have forgotten that the meaning of educational uh, research should be different besides helping us to understand uh, pedagogical processes research should be used to transform and improve them so with this conviction that uh, uh, with, with this conviction that the research should be a collaborative process and the commitment to carry out research with schools to promote a social transformation, we create Pedalab UGR. Pedalab, uh, in Pedalab, we transfer the concept of citizen lab to an educational context with the purpose of generating a meeting place for different professionals, teachers and researchers to share educational experiences and promote collaborative research. Training, research and knowledge uh, transfer are the pillars of, on which the lab activity is based. Uh, we started the lab with a cyber cafe in January where all participants were divided into groups to discuss their needs and proposals. The topics that came out of the teacher discussions were related to collaborative networks, research and the arts as educative mediation. So we developed the activity of Pedalab around these themes. We met twice a month and each month a topic is addressed. In the first session of the month, a teacher presents a project, which is then discussed with the group. And in the second session, we invite an expert on the topic in question to teach us more and deep our knowledge. In one of these sessions, we address the topic of educational research and the group showed 
interested in participating in collaborative research process. So taking into account their needs and requirements, we have launched a project involved 11 teachers. In this research, we are going to investigate the sound imagery of children between 10 and 14 years old from a qualitative perspective. We are interested in knowing what mini music has for them. Um, from there, we will devise pedagogical resources for the development of critical listening. All the activity of the lab can be seen on our website and Telegram and YouTube channels. And if you have any question, you can contact us through this email. Uh, to finish, the only I want to say thank you uh, to all the people that are working in the lab, my colleagues from ECUFOP and the teachers, uh, because after five months, we, have, we can say that we have created a horizontal way to professionals from different sectors to work towards a common goal. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your presentation, Almudena. Now we're going to listen to Andrea Sexner and Petra Harut. Are you there? Yeah, hello. Yes. Okay, so that's for inviting. Petra is here as well. Good to hear. Yes. So uh, we have no uh, slides uh, prepared, but would like to give you a brief glimpse into what we are doing in a um, co-creative um, citizen science-based project called Co-ops for Food. I'll post you the link here so you get some information in English. And uh, by the way, um, I would be very much interested in uh, commenting on drafts or stuff, but I can't attend to the living labs after 11.30. And I think Peter has difficulties here too. So uh, in this project, um, Co-ops for Food, um, we are dealing with what we call diverse economies of sustainable food. Uh, subtitle of the project is from mainstream alternatives to an alternative mainstream. It's funded by the Austrian Climate and Energy Fund and it runs for two and a half years. And we had um, the idea of co-creating already the research question um, um, at the beginning uh, very much in mind. So our partner structure combines um, scientific actors from the Regional Center of Expertise and the IFZ in Graz with practice partners like a cooperative um, federation, um, like neighborhood centers in Graz and a member of the Chamber of Agriculture in Styria, that's the province where we are located. And uh, the challenge that we wanted to address is that on the one hand, we see the spread of what is called alternative um, agro-food networks across the country, uh, as it is the case worldwide more or less uh, like uh, in Austria, for instance, uh, we have a lot of food cops and community supported agriculture initiatives where consumers and producers uh, of food um, are trying to work together in, in new collaborative cooperative forms. Uh, but these initiatives are often socially exclusive for different reasons and have not really achieved to impact the mainstream of food consumption and production towards more sustainability. On the other hand, we have a traditional cooperative sector in Austria, as, as of course many or most of the countries in the world have, with a lot of experience dating back to the 90s, 19th century, but with difficulties to adapting to new questions, for instance, in terms of ecology, of getting more innovative, of addressing uh, more people. And so in the project, we try to bring together these two actors. And we also want to engage citizens um, and we like to do that uh, with, a, with an approach that we call food stories. So we like to, um, we are at the beginning of the project, we like to, to form groups of people from different social groups, consumers, uh, producers, um, vulnerable groups uh, that tell us something about their everyday life experiences with food. And we'd like to collect these informations, could be texts, um, uh, recordings, uh, photographs, uh, different sorts of material. We'd like to collect that multimedia material, spread this material through social media. Like to, uh, we, we would like to politicize the question of good food, of sustainable food through this engagement of citizens in this, in this sense of deep citizen science, uh, that, uh, how, we, how we call it. On the other hand, the second strand of our co-production research is that we'd like to set the impulse for creating a new form of cooperative um, 
building on the strength of the traditional cooperative idea and the innovative aspects of these alternative agri-food networks. And um, here we try to use a methodology that Petra would, uh, would like to explain to you. It's called systematization of experiences. Just a few words. Yes, thank you, Andreas. Uh, thank you for um, inviting us to share um, our project where we are um, starting. My name is Petra Herod. I'm a freelance uh, consultant and trainer on knowledge management, experience, capitalizing, and sharing. And my part in this Cops for Food project, as Andreas just uh, uh, gave a, a glimpse of it, is to, um, to guide this learning journey and, and learn from the experience we have in this very multidimensional and colorful consortium, so the different players, and um, also with the different marginalized groups we are working. And the methods that um, I use for, for these learning processes and reflection processes is a method that comes originally from South America. So um, this you know, innovative method that we are using here in, in uh, Austria is uh, originally from South America and it's called systematization of experiences. And it's based and deeply rooted in um, the work of Paulo Freire, um, it will, who is a Brazilian, who was a Brazilian author and educator and um, influenced quite a lot the critical pedag pedagogic um, approaches. So um, what does it mean to systematize experiences? Um, basically, we know that in projects and citizens' uh, engagement, there is a lot of perceptions and very subjective experiences that happen. So one experience from one stakeholder group, it can be very, very different to the experience to another one. And a true learning process can happen if you do it in a participatory way. So the method that we use, systematization of experiences, is a highly participatory method where you um, structure and systematize ex um, existing experiences in different stakeholder groups in order to, um, to produce knowledge about action or practice and in the long term um, improve um, our practice and also communicate the learnings. So this method is um, already documented quite well. Um, my personal experience is uh, in development cooperation. So over 15 years I've been working in project management and learning exercises from Latin America to African um, continents where citizens engagement is also a very big topic. And uh, I will send a link into the chat where you can read on the method. There is different manuals on the method and there is also some papers and articles that I, um, uh, I wrote on this method with some colleagues. And if you're interested on the um, on, on the method or um, interested to integrate such a participatory learning um, journey or learning exercise into your project, then um, uh, you can get in touch with, with me directly. So I will send it to the chat just now. And yeah, the, it's available in different languages in um, Spanish, English, and French. Um, I can offer documentation on the method and also guidance. Yes, that's from my side. Um, I would like to close with, I, th I think it was Rosa Luxemburg who said that we will only succeed if we don't forget how to learn. And I think citizens engagement and citizen science has a lot to do as uh, a lot of the other speakers have already said is, is learning and, and experience sharing and taking our rich experiences to improve and further develop our communities, um, cities. Uh, etc. So um, uh, I think this integrating learning uh, and integrating participatory ways of learning is crucial and I would love to get in touch uh, and, and, and share an exchange also with other projects of how you do that and which methods you use there. Uh, thank you. Thanks Petra, uh, amazing. Uh, we continue uh, with uh, Audrey Mathur, University of Lyon. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Audrey. Are you there? Uh, Audrey? Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Hi. I'm here. Sorry, so 
Uh, hello everyone, uh, we are two researchers uh, at University of Lyon and uh, I will speak about our collaboration with the Department of the University of Lyon, uh, La Boutique des Sciences, uh, that permits us to collaborate with an association and to work with it on the life uh, course of students uh, with uh, dyslexia. Can you see my slides? It's okay. Can you switch in the presentation mode, please? Uh, you cannot see my slides? No? I can see it. Ah, okay. So I continue. Um, uh, so the French association ATUDIS is an association about this, uh, these disorders. Uh, so about, for instance, dyslexia, but also dysorthographia, dyscalculia, dysphasia, etc. And uh, the main objective of this association is to gather different types of forces around these disorders. This association wants to create an, 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 alliance, an alliance of skills coming from families, researchers, and personnel from the health, education, and professional insertion uh, sectors. And in order to develop their association, the president, Nicole Philibert, has expressed a need for an internship to work on the life course of people with dyslexia. Uh, she has taken advantage of the Department of the University of Lyon, La Boutique des Sciences, to respond uh, to their needs. Je demande à ce que tu passes en mode écran total, s'il te plaît. Comment oh, Tu crois Parce que vous ne voyez pas les slides On les voit, mais on passe en mode diapo, s'il te plaît. Et là, c'est bon Ici, c'est bon can you see my slides now? Okay, good morning. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, in order to have a transdisciplinary vision of the internship, the association and uh, La Boutique des Sciences decided to put into place a scientific supervision, but always with the collaboration of the uh, association. These transdisciplinary supervisions permits also to respond to the initial uh, request of the association with a scientific foundation and uh, to benefit from the supervision of uh, the Boutique des Sciences. Uh, for instance, uh, La Boutique des Sciences proposed some uh, training. Um, from this interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, a scientific project is born, a Parvidis project. Uh, the goal was to develop semi-structured interviews with both uh, dyslexic students and members of their family based on multidisciplinary uh, theories and methodologies, and in order to have a better understanding of uh, the life courses of students with dyslexia, uh, life skills, adaptations, obstacles, levers, social, social, social participations, etc and in order to contribute, contribute uh, to fundamental research in the field of dyslexia. And the internship was integrated in this big uh, project and at some specific missions. Um, the internship uh, uh, have, has to develop uh, to help to develop the data collection protocol to help to up uh, of a questionnaire about a life course and dyslexia uh, in a uh, transdisciplinary perspective uh, to participate in the selection of a sample and uh, to participate to the interview of young adults with dyslexia and a parent. Moreover, we created some specific uh, deliverables linked to the internship, a general public logbook on uh, the scientific approach to adult dyslexia. And uh, af after, I, uh, I can put uh, some links in the chat. Um, a glossary, uh, a communication, uh, material, communication, uh, some communication materials in video format, and uh, an internship uh, report. 
And what about uh, the project? Uh, even if the internship is over, the research project continues and the internship was a part of, from a larger project. Uh, we have transcribed all the, da the data and a large part is coded and the first uh, analysis are ongoing. Moreover, concerning the research project, we, be we begin the dissemination, a document uh, promoting research uh, on uh, uh, health FM, we continue uh, the projects by seeking new funding and uh, we write a dossier in the, in the journal L'Orthophonist, special specializing in dyslexia in adulthood. Thank you for your attention and uh, a special thanks to the students. Uh, so then to, to the assistant engineer Camille Brett and the students and their family who answer all the questionnaires. Okay, thank you, Audrey. I think there were some problems with the slides and the screen sharing, but Sorry. I think the information was uh, very clear, so it's no problem. And now we go back to the University of Padua. Carlota Mazzoldi, are you there? Yes, I see your sharing your screen. Yes, yes here I am. Um, would you please uh, put the presentation mode for the slides? Okay. Can perfect. you see? It? Can you see? Yeah, it? no problem. Okay, perfect. So, good morning, everyone. And what I'm going to present to you is the Babel Act project on monitoring marine species through citizen science developed in the Northern Adriatic Sea and the Lagoon of Venice. And within this project, there are several small projects with specific goals and specific stakeholders. And basically, if we talk about our goal is to collect data on marine species about occurrence, distribution, the appearance of new species, rare species, and so on. To build together with, uh, especially with fishermen, conservation action, uh, and increase public awareness about the themes of uh, conservation of marine biodiversity, but also uh, the topic related to our responsible behavior to contribute to the conservation of marine species. And we are trying to do this through the involvement of the different stakeholders in collaborative project. And with stakeholders, what we mean are professional and recreational fishers, but also the general public, like the beach user, the boat users, and more in general, people interested in uh, um, the preservation of biodiversity. So uh, to carry on this project, uh, we developed several web portals. We just try to, uh, to make some campaigns to uh, alert uh, the different stakeholders about our project. We built some web portal for the reporting of unknown or rare or protected species, the observation or capture, uh, reporting or capture of target individuals or sharks and skates that are endangered species, and uh, reporting of a recreational capture of sharks and skates. And this is just an example of one of our web portal for the reporting of the recapture of target individuals. Yeah. The, the data we are collecting are related to the occurrence of the different species, like uh, alien species are represented here with the blue crab, fishery species interaction, like the capture of protected species, like sea turtles, <laughs> tracking movement of tagged individuals. We basically. There are some problems. I, I hear some. Okay. Uh, tracking movement of animals, like we tag uh, sharks and skates, and then if the fisher report the recapture, we can know uh, where the individual moved, and develop and monitor effectiveness of conservation action as represented by the cattle fish acts uh, uh, laid on, on, on some um, branches that we put in the water with fishermen. The uh, strength and the weakness of this approach, uh, that of our approach, uh, but I think it applies also for other uh, citizen science project, uh, is related to uh, the large sampling effort we can have involving the different stakeholders. Uh, for instance, fishers spend a very long time in, in, on the sea and they know very well about uh, the species that are appearing, uh, disappearing or declining. 
higher success of conservation action through a participatory process. And this is a very important uh, issue, I think, because we need to, to work with Fisher from the very beginning in order to, to have uh, a success in our action and increase of awareness uh, through uh, the interaction with question, uh, direct interaction with the different stakeholder, but also the feeling of involvement in research and conservation projects, both of fishers and the general public. The weakness of this kind of approach, I think it is very time demanding. We need to, to build a very uh, personal relationship with the different fishers, for instance, but also uh, uh, make a lot of effort in trying to involve the general public in this kind of project. The need to overcome suspicion, and this is very common with fishers, but also the need to build loyalty in order to be able to continue collecting data. And thank you very much for your attention. This is a project carried on by different researcher, uh, PhD or postdoc student uh, of the University of Padua. Okay, thank you, Carlotta. Uh, now is the time for Clement Zevo from the University of Lyon. Are you hi, here? Hi, everyone. Yep. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Clément Thibault. I'm currently a student at Sciences Po Lyon studying political sociology and specialize in public policy analysis. I will briefly present to you the project I'll be in 2020 with the Boutique des Sciences of the University of Lyon and the association Réseau Fèvre about the recognition of groups of project builders on the workplace. So to briefly explain the context of the study, have to know that Resofeb is an association based in Lyon that supports employees who want to build environmental and or social projects on their workplace. Those projects can be to reduce waste production or energy used by their company, collect and recycle used items like glasses or phones, create social events with their colleagues, etc. Resofeb helps those project builders in defining their project, knowing where to put the effort, how to talk to colleagues to get them to join the project, and they also provide formation and tools in project management. So their goal is really to accompany the project builder in his or her project and creating a group of employees on the workplace to help him or her conduct the project and carry more in the future. So why do this study? Well, the association noticed that those project builders had troubles carrying out their projects because they didn't have enough time, because their colleagues weren't involved, because their managers were opposed to the project. So for Réseau Fair, the problem was the lack of recognition of these groups by the company they work in. That is why they asked me to work on the possibilities of legal recognition of these groups. But as we moved forward, we quickly concluded that the key was not legal recognition. Why? Because there are not a lot of legal status for a group of people in the French legal system. There's the association like Resofeb, the union, like the workers' union, or a section in the employee representative committee. And also uh, symbolic recognition uh, doesn't mean as necessary uh, more means to conduct the project. And most of the time is just a symbolic support from the company and its leader. Therefore, I focused my study on the sociological interactions behind those projects. Who are the project builders? Which type of projects do they conduct? What type of company do they work for? And what factors facilitate the implementation of projects in the workplace? So I based my study on 17 interviews and an online survey. I was then able to identify an external factor and an internal factor that facilitate the implementation of those projects. So the external factor is the identity of the organization. If there is an environmental and or social aspect in the company's activity, the projects are more welcomed because they become part of the company's own project. The company also has to be open to employee initiative, which is not always the case. Um, some do not want the employees to spend time on the workplace doing another thing that strictly their jobs. So also if uh, the company started an environmental initiative, for example, to reduce their ecological impact, the projects will be easier to conduct. At last, uh, the affinities and values of the managers and leaders of the company influence a lot, which is why I advise them to observe closely how their company works, to target which manager they can talk to and make them become an ally. 
So the second point is the internal factor. Uh, it's the method used to conduct the project. So the project builders I interviewed that succeeded to implement their projects were the ones in a lobbying approach. It means uh, identify the key actors in the company and make them allies. It means build yourself a position of expertise which will legitimize the project. It also means using external resources like the personal network, local associations, communication, etc. So with those conclusions, I was able to build a report with those elements and also guidelines for the project builders so they can know better how to conduct their project on their workplace and how to structure a strong group that will be recognized by their peers and managers. So that's it for me and thank you for listening. Thank you, Clement. Uh, the next presentation is that of, uh, sorry if my pronunciation is not correct, uh, Igli Shumeskin, uh, University of Vilnius. Are you there, Igli? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, I would like to share my screen, but... Uh... Not sure if I succeed, but I can do it uh, without also. So my subject is about uh, the active role of people with intellectual disabilities uh, during the process of the institutionalization of care services. Uh, so in Lithuania now uh, we are undergoing the reform uh, which is aimed at replacing the inhuman care in large institutional settings with community services for people with disabilities. Uh, the pro uh, reform aims also to promote human rights, inclusion and participation in the society of people with disabilities. Uh, it is welcomed by the human rights advocates, by national and international non-governmental organizations, Yet uh, the reform faces adverse public discourse because the local communities tend to object to the relocation of persons with disabilities into their neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, sometimes we face the situation when uh, politicians, officials uh, objectify persons with disabilities and ignore their needs and their priorities. Um, so what does this objectification mean? Uh, first of all, it's ignoring the main principle of nothing about us without us. And the reform is not representative of disabled persons' experiences. Uh, they have limited opportunities to choose where and with whom to live. There is a danger of trans-institutionalization that the institutional culture from large care institutions will be transferred to the community settings. And also we observe the, uh, the geography of intolerance uh, spreads from um, surrounding of the large um, institutions to the small community settings. Thus uh, the landscape of stigma is also changing. Uh, having this in mind, we conducted the research and now we are in the process of analyzing the data. Um, uh, the research aims to analyze how the understanding of community welfare and practices of its development are being transformed during the process of the institutionalization and development of community services. Um, so we conducted uh, qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, first of all, we did 32 interviews with persons with disabilities who moved from large institutions to community settings. With the 14 of their carers, social workers mainly, uh, service providers in the community, like someone who's working as a barista in the cafeteria, running a small shop, uh, working in the market, or uh, somewhere else in the community, in the library, for instance. And uh, 21 interview with this just regular community members that we met on the streets and approached with certain questions. 
media discourse was also analyzed. And we found out that in 139 articles about um, the reform of institutional care, only in seven articles uh, there were persons with disabilities asked something about their lives, about their priorities, about how they are doing in the community. So um, here I would like to quote one uh, uh, scholar with a disability himself. He said that uh, lack of participatory tradition in the disability research uh, means that uh, uh, the traditional research methodologies disempower and disenfranchise disabled research participants by placing their knowledge into the hands of the researcher to interpret and make recommendations on their behalf. Um, since um, the research we conducted during the, the current time, we had limited opportunities to more properly involve people with disabilities in the process as uh, core researchers. But uh, then we were piloting and I think we succeeded in uh, involving them as um, uh, in the um, dissemination and communication of the data we gathered. Uh, so uh, an important aim of the project became to channel the impact of persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities as experts by experience to policy and practice of the institutionalization of care. And earlier this year, in January, we had an online dissemination event and we had four presenters with a personal experience of being um, residents in institutional care and transferred to the community care. Then in February, uh, we had an online dissemination event together with Disability Rights NGO and included a comprehensive presentation of an expert by experience. Then in March this year, we had a joint interview about the project on the national television. And uh, I myself was present during that interview, but most importantly, uh, we managed to ask and involve uh, a person uh, with a living experience of, of disability to, to participate in the interview and share his uh, attitudes. And uh, actually later today, in a few hours, we have a consultation with the Ministry of Social Security and Labor about the communication of the reform of the institutionalization with the society and communities. And our main recommendations will be based on inclusion of experts by experience of people with disabilities in the communication and dissemination. And I would like to finish with a quote uh, that there is nothing more powerful than a person who has nothing left to lose, yet still has the courage to stand up and look the world in the eye. So. Um, in, in our future research, we are very much looking forward to more involved persons with disabilities as co-researchers, not only in the face of uh, dissemination. Uh, so this is my presentation. Thank you for your attention very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. And thanks to, to all the speakers for adjusting to the time allocated to them. For now, it's, it's going great so far. Now we're going to be listening to Frank Becker from the University of Berlin. Frank, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hello. Good morning to everybody. And uh, I will run to, with you through a presentation uh, about how citizens get access to um, scientific work, uh, starting with a DIY project on fine dust measurement uh, some citizens uh, find it interesting to um, join a platform called Luftdateninfo, a uh, Europe-wide network on fine dust pollution measurements, where you can um, contribute uh, to the data on the uh, map by building yourself a measurement device you see uh, right here. Uh, it's about 30 euros. So um, it's quite easy for citizens uh, to step in 
uh, to scientific work. And um, this found the interest of uh, several Bana students. So what is Bana? Bana is a guest student course for studies at Technische Universität Berlin, which I uh, join as well as the staff uh, of citizen uh, of science shop Kubus. And I do not need to explain what a science shop is thanks to the brilliant presentation of Florence Bernard from Université de Lille. And um, we have uh, some very special students self-organized project laboratories at the uh, Technische Universität Berlin, which is, I would say, completely unique, uh, at least in Germany, that students organize uh, their teaching and learning seminars completely uh, self-organized. Um, and we brought together this uh, guest student course of Bana, where elderly uh, students um, are doing their um, courses with uh, these project laboratories. So um, there was a first um, project lab on building future um, together with uh, elderly students and full-time students of uh, TU Berlin. And we brought in the scope and the perspective of citizen science uh, into citizens engagement. And uh, from that on, these uh, Bana students started to self-organize a teaching and learning seminar on their own, which was uh, focused on um, citizens' engagement. And we uh, monitor, Kubus, the science shop of TU Berlin and Bana together monitored and supported uh, this self-organized tutorial and thought, yeah, that might be a good idea to uh, give some input on how to organize citizen science work. And um, yeah, there is, um, now there is a, a link to, to the chair of uh, climate uh, science on te Technische Universität and uh, the citizens, the students themselves introduced um, questions, um, topics uh, to do further research on, for example, the question, is there a relation between fine dust pollution and uh, the infection rate on COVID-19? So this is uh, not a trivial question and we support uh, the, the citizens in uh, translating their live world questions into scientific research questions. Um, so that's uh, the finishing of my presentation um, because as most of you know, we face a lot of stumbling stones in citizen science. Um, first, stumbling stone might be how to find uh, citizens interested and in matching to scientific work. Um, so that's uh, one service we as Science Shop Kubus do at uh, Technische Universität because we are wired to uh, many NGOs and civil society organizations in, in Germany. And we do trainings for citizens, uh, for, for scientists, sorry, for scientists uh, on the fact that my counterpart is not myself. So that's a scientist should not expect that the human being in front of them is uh, scientifically focused as themselves. And um, we organize something which is called uh, cultural translation because um, we are convinced that um, we can enable the cooperation on eye level between scientific community and uh, civil society by translating the different languages uh, in different areas of our society 
to improve the conversation and um, support some kind of uh, reflection processes uh, on two levels um, in organizing research projects on in a transdisciplinary and participatory way. So that is um, what I wanted to present you. And uh, I uploaded my presentation on the, on the indicated platform already. So you can find my presentation there if you want to get in touch with me. You have to make use of my private email at the moment because Technische Universität is facing a massive hacker attack all our mail servers are down and we have no access to our data at the moment so that's a very serious situation um, in fact in combination with one year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you for your um, attention and uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your presentation Frank and uh, good luck with the server situation. Hope we get fixed soon. <laughs> uh, talk about two months. <laughs> uh, now we're going to listen to Guidre Godien from the University of Vilnius. Are you there? Yes. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yep. Um, I am Guidre Godien from Vilnius University, and um, I am landscape geographer. So I would like to present um, common uh, joint initiative uh, by Vilnius University and Lithuanian Geographical Society, uh, which we launched uh, last year uh, when the pandemic uh, started and uh, Lithuania was in total lockdown, especially on March. It was a big, big scare of what will happen. And um, of course, uh, we do not uh, use before uh, a lot of uh, digital methodology of citizen science and mostly uh, engaged people uh, in participatory processes with discussions, workshops and labs, which were alive. So this all digital uh, methodologies were new for us, but we managed to um, find out new ideas and uh, launch an uh, idea on geographical night, which is uh, internationally uh, organized in all Europe and now in all the world, uh, and we called um, a geographical window. Uh, and this was a reflection uh, like social and personal stress relief uh, to have meaningful actions on that lockdown. And of course, promotion of geography discipline and digital deductive materials, which were uh, very used, uh, very needful for teachers, uh, which uh, started to make uh, uh, very uh, big uh, changes in, ped <laughs> in schools because uh, all schools were closed. So uh, also we collect, uh, we wanted to collect the data on perception of landscape of everyday life. So uh, what we ask to do people uh, to turn uh, everyday view into curious observation and research and upload the picture of the day taken through your window, personal view, uh, point of the objects, processes, and uh, which could represent wealth disciplines of geography family. So it was a, a task to make photograph and make descriptions. And we gather data spatially organized, visual, qualitative, and quantitative. And what it looks like? It looks like, like a picture of, of mapping uh, uh, the pictures. And I want to stress out that in one day we have um, uh, 140 responses and uh, in a week we have uh, more than 300 responses and most of, of these uh, were uh, teachers uh, which provide uh, the, this exercise for pupils at schools and so uh, we have responses not from Lithuania but uh, the worldwide also and it was um, normally uh, interactive map picture and story uh, exercise you can look at what the picture looks like and what the stories. And uh, what I want to stress with this, um, our initiative, and uh, we this year we have the similar one um, to find out and uh, uh, stress 
the idea that not all landscapes need to be exceptional. We have to live in everyday uh, surroundings and can find a lot of very interesting points of view, uh, which uh, uh, every person can find in their surroundings, everyday situations. And of course, uh, this, um, uh, this initiative uh, uh, let us know uh, who uh, recognize and uh, how many of geographical disciplines, and you can find out uh, we made some calculations, to, uh, quantitative data, and um, it was interesting that uh, most people, of course, uh, speaks about the weather. That is the most important theme uh, of everyday life speaking. And it is very difficult to find out these courses, for example, for geology or cultural geog geography. Uh, and most of our um, groups participated are um, school pupils. Uh, also, it was interesting to find out that uh, Lithuanians are very, um, very uh, um, people who want to uh, do everything. So a lot of people recognize even 12 disciplines of geography. So that was uh, my point of view. I, in, uh, in Vilnius University and Lithuanian Geographical Society, we have a lot of uh, very different kind of participatory processes. And it would be very interesting to discuss later. So thank you for your attention and see you soon. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, the next is that uh, of um, Harald Sodeman and Mika Lansi, University of Bergen. Are you there? Yes, OK. Yes. I am, and I just need to be full screen. Okay, good. So yeah, my name is Mika Lansky, and I'm the PhD student in the Snowpace project, which is funded by the Norwegian Research Council. There we go. So when you go skiing in Norway during Easter, there are certain things you should bring with you an Easter egg, of course, for your kids, and the special local Norwegian chocolate or soda that you can see here. And if you participate in our citizen science project, a small snow sampling kit. As a part of holiday traditions, Norwegians will migrate to their cabins in the mountains to enjoy skiing in nice spring weather. We utilize this to ask the skiers to help us collect snow samples from all over the country. The water in the snow is what we're after, as it can help us understand the atmospheric water cycle. And understanding the water cycle is particularly important for Norway due to the economic importance of the hydropower production. The atmospheric water cycle can be described as the journey of the water vapor. Starting from its sources in the North Atlantic Ocean, it will travel northeast until it reaches the Norwegian mountains where it will hopefully fall as snow. This snow can then be sampled and measured in the laboratory. A special molecular property called isotopes acts as a natural tracer and records how much snow has fallen from the air during this journey. What makes it very suitable for citizen science is that these isotopes don't require a strict sampling protocol, so you don't need any special equipment or any training to just take a snow sample. Anyone can do it, even kids, or maybe actually especially kids, as this can be used as a fun family activity as seen here. So we provided our participants with this kit containing a log sheet, bottles and bags and a spoon, and simply asked them to collect some snow, melt it and return it to us. So in our project, we need people to participate and be physically present twice when they pick up their snow sampling kit and also when they return a sample. And this does present some added challenges regarding the retention of our participants. So shown here is an overview of the different stages of our project and overall green is good, red is bad and the other colors are various details. And what we can see is that we lost participants mainly at two stages. Those who signed up but did not collect a snow sampling kit and those who did have their kit but did not return with a sample for whatever reason. But in total, we did get around 80 participants with contributing with around 200 samples, which looks something like this. So shown here is a map outline of Southern Norway for your orientation. Oslo is located here, the capital, 
and Bergen, Bergen is located here on the west coast. And what we can observe from these isotopes is a gradient going from west to east, from higher to lower values, or lighter to darker colors. And this is consistent with the moisture arriving from the west and continuing to rain out as it travels further inland. And the great spatial coverage makes it possible for us to confirm this underlying theory. So to sum up, in our project, we utilize an exceptional cultural framework of Easter skiing to, in a simple, straightforward manner, sample snow, which can tell us about its transport history. And despite challenges regarding pickup and return, we obtained a large space of coverage with the help from our volunteers. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mika. That was great. Uh, the next speaker is Hélène Chauveau from the University of Lyon. Are you there? Uh, just, Hélène is sick, so I will oh, do okay. for Okay, can you see yeah. my slide? Uh, yeah, but we can see a very small, if you can... Okay, that, perfect. Is, that, is it perfect? Yep. Okay, so just quickly, so... Um, just some words about the impact evaluation of our science shop, some general results, because Hélène Chauveau was our PhD student immersed in the science shop. So what can we say about the impact study? Uh, more and more financial directions say, okay, what's the use of your tools? How it works, what the impact? So the problem was to how can we measure this impact? What does it mean when we have to measure these kind of things? So our objectives of this study was to formalize for more visibility and recognition. It's very important to, to prove to our governance, to our direction, that it's not only um, training and so on, it, it has really an impact on the student's career, the student's training, and as said Audrey just before, that can have a change for a research project. And also the objective of this impact study was to understand in order to better pilot and accompany involved stakeholders. So what was our methodology? We use an impact evaluation methodology constructed by a postdoctoral student immersed in the science shop over one year, which was very important. We, we work with the agency, independent agency, which is used to, to design and apply impact study with cultural action, cultural institutions like a library, like a museum and, okay, because we were aware that it was in this dimension. Okay, so what can we say? As I said just before, we have three global missions. One is to participate in the territorial development of Lyon rhone alpes by supporting civil society organizations, associations, citizens groups, so what we did as a methodology, we elaborate and analyze a questionnaire sent to the 51 CSO, having worked on project with the science shop. Four in-depth interviews with partner structures, consultation on the results, and participant observation methodology applied during the two workshops of the year. So what, that was the first methodology for, to analyze our first mission. The second one is to train students on innovative approaches to research with and for society and improve their employability with 21st century skills. So what was, what was our methodology? First, three exploratory interviews. After that, 14 anonymized and, and post questionnaires with 2020 students. 
uh, 20 students, I think, not 2020. <laughs> okay, participant observation during the three training sessions of the year. After that, elaboration and analysis of a questionnaire sent to the 60 students who benefited from the science shop. So that was the first uh, impact study, the th second one. And the third one, I remember my, our mission is to adapt research by shifting the practices of co-construction and dissemination of knowledge in the academic world. So what did we do with our researcher? State of play, four exploratory interviews with researchers, literature review, of course, participation in five study days, Columbium seminars on participatory research, 20 interviews with lecturer, researcher, who have supervised the internships of students. What can we say about the result? Some global general conclusion, which is the impact to ACSO. First, new relationships with territory actors, increased of professional network, which is very important for them. For them, it's a good opportunity to organize a collective reflection on the project of the CSO, as I explained this morning in my introduction. Third one, a support to think about the world in the society. And the last one for the CSO, that gives them some communication elements to do some lobbying and advocacy. Okay, what are what our conclusion, what is our conclusion for students thanks to this methodology? First one, a good previous experience for their professional career, confirmed. Second one, a good experience with real problems, with real people. Third one, a professional network, which is now important, as we said. And the fourth one, some new skills, definitively in communication, project management, and professional relationships. In addition to the skills that they have developed in the curricula. And for the researcher, what can we say of the impact of this kind of experience? A network with active stakeholders, also for them, a view of social demand, some ideas from new research topics. And the third, third one, which is not the last one, the legitimation of the added value to society. And this study gives us some, uh, some ideas in order to improve our science shop. First one, to keep working with CSO after the project, what was important to maintain this partnership. Second one, to help them to find new financial supports. So the science shop project was the first step for them to go further in their um, ask for knowledge or improving. The third one is to formalize and verbalize our mediation tools and specific training. It's important, as I said this morning, to show that the time we, we can say that we lose to to put in contact with CSO, to train students, and to disseminate the result, the results are very, very important. And that gives us the idea for us to create an alumni of science shop students and CSO students. And the last one, to follow the agenda of the CSO or civil society more attentively to change our view, maybe not on the academic world, but to pay attention of the agenda of the civil CSO organizations. And we have, so thanks to this impact study, we can do more lobbying advocacy also for our science shop. Thank you for your attention. See you later. Thank you. Um, the following presentation is that of our colleague Lydia Bocanegra. Her project is a perfect example 
uh, of citizen science at the University of Granada. Uh, Lydia, are you there? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Go Just ahead. a second. I will try to uh, uh, share my... Okay, very good. Let me check. Hold on. Mm -mm. I'm not able now, sorry. So basically, I will uh, explain uh, about uh, my project of co-history analysis of public participation in historical research from the perspective of citizen science. Uh, I have a problem with my presentation, sorry. I am not able to share that. I don't know what's happening. Um, Lydia, it would be great if you try to share your presentation. Since yes, I'm trying to, to share my presentation. Just a second, please. Yes. Hold on. Well, Lydia is uh, trying to fix the, the problem with the slides. We okay. remind everyone just... that in order to get the certification, please write to Sonia Arcus if you haven't done it yet. Okay. I think. Yeah. Sorry for the for the delay. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, yeah. perfectly. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for that. Okay, I'm Lydia Bocanegra. I'm working in the Media Lab UGR. So thank you, my colleagues and the Arcus Organization to give me the opportunity to present my project today. So I am the IP of the Co-History Analysis of Public Participation in Historical Research from the perspective of citizen science. And uh, this, is a funded by, uh, this is a funded project by University of Granada with the European funding. And basically the, the main goals of the... Uh, sorry. Okay. The co-history goals are to detect, uh, analyze, test, and standardize methodological practice of public participation in national and international research projects from the history disciplines. So uh, carry out from the university or other institution. When I, uh, when I specify history discipline, I mean a wide range of uh, specializations within it. So basically contemporary history, classical history, medieval history, uh, music history, history of literature, etc. So in other words, co-historia to, intends to understand what, what role citizen science is playing in humanities, specifically in the discipline of history, and how this participatory, uh, particip uh, participatory citizen methodology is put into practice. So basically, there are some questions that we try to, uh, to answer with the project. So is participation used more uh, at a co-creative uh, or contribution level? Is digital or face-to-face -face participation through citizen labs more widely used? So these are some of the questions. And in the main, basically, we try to demonstrate that unlike what is believed, more and more research projects are implementing this participatory strategy typical of other disciplines in the development of research and that, in turn, it is implemented in an improvised manner without making the most of it. This is the hypothesis of mine. I will try to verify it at the end of the, of the project. So basically, uh, as I said before, this is their specific objective. The first one is identify and map research projects in history that use public participation from citizen science in their execution, whether national, European, or international at the digital level or not. Also, the uh, objective is uh, to analyze the data from the identified projects, connecting them with the scientific literature on, on citizen science from other disciplines as well. In other words, uh, the, the idea is to look for common patterns of this public practice, both digital and physical level. Also, the uh, uh, other objective is to testing the methodology of public participation analyzed through the history research projects through the implemented implementation of thematic uh, pilot cases. Uh, 
At the end, we will try to standardize uh, of methodological practice in citizen science, following analysis and pretesting in pilot cases for the development of best practice guidelines on public participation in digital and physical environments and also public engagement in history research. You can see here at the, at the, at the site a screenshot of one of the uh, already uh, mapped uh, projects. Here is the methodological framework of history. Uh, now we are working in the phase one and phase two. I, I can say this is a very a pretty new project. We started last year. At the moment, we have already classified around 200 projects, more or less. And uh, after that, we, we will try to connect with the uh, scientific literature, with uh, uh, citizen science. We need to say that the, in, the, in the very beginning, we, we, we spend a lot of time to classify the projects, to thinking about the classification project uh, process, sorry, uh, for each project, we use uh, 30 different parameters, okay, to the, for the classification. This internal web database, uh, we divide the classification process in two parts. One of them is uh, regarding the public participation and the other one is regarding for the public engagement strategy. Also, we will try in this phase, in the second phase, to uh, perform an international seminar in order to um, to show the preliminary results and uh, to connect with other ideas. And uh, I will invite the different uh, specialists in citizen science in history. Of course, this uh, methodology is used, is widely used within the digital humanities field and also the digital public history. After that, in the, the next year, we will try to do a different pilot cases. During the, due to the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, we will change a bit, a bit the, 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 the pilot cases. Um, previously, we, we, we intend, uh, will intend to do some um, living labs, but now we will do some more digital environments. So transcribathons, we will do collection days in, in hybrid mode, and maybe if it's possible and the pandemic can give, me, give us the opportunity, we will do a living lab. Of course, uh, everything the media lab will be, will be involved in order uh, for the living lab uh, pilot cases. The idea with these pilot cases is to verify the methodology uh, already identified in the different projects and for the, the idea to uh, um, obtain a good practice guide in public participation and also a good practice guide in public engagement in citizen science and history research. So this is the methodology framework uh, and and here you can see also uh, small screenshots of the different projects already uh, identified. Uh, at the moment, we are working in the private web page uh, with a private uh, web databases because uh, we will try to uh, map in the, as much as, as possible the different projects. We are different databases from the European uh, funded project and also uh, other uh, web databases. And when we finish, we, maybe in a couple of months, we will launch the, uh, the the web page in order that people can also add their, uh, their uh, own projects in history. And here, and you can see the different uh, information for the, each project. And in the left, you can see an unrest project and setting remembering and social cohesion in transnational Europe project is a very interesting project that is uh, funded by European Commission. And the other one is another uh, uh, details of other projects, the George Washington trip. So this is a very, well, yeah, for me, it's, it's very interesting because we, for the first time in history, we can see which uh, the, are the methodologies, the, the participation process that the people on institutions, uh, scientific, social scientific, uh, scientists, uh, researchers are uh, using for. And this is my presentation. I try to do very fast because I have it a lot of time at the very beginning. Thank you very much. I hear this is my email. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lydia. That was very interesting. And we hope to see you around the office soon. The next speaker is Lucas Spielhofer from the University of Graz. Are you here, Lucas? Yes, hello. Perfect. So you can share your screen if you need to or. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a question. Does everyone see my slide? Yeah, we can see it, no problem. Great. Okay, so um, today I would like to present to you a, a project I was part of um, in the last couple of years. We conducted at the University 
of Karate's Institute of Classics in collaboration with the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities. Uh, the Graz Repository of Ancient Fables, in short, Graf, um, is a, I, I can put the link, just one second, I can put the link in the chat, um, so you can have a look yourself, or I'll put it later. Um, the Graz Repository of Ancient Fables is a, an online platform which provides a range of resources to study and teach ancient fable literature in classrooms, in schools, and universities. Its main feature is a selection of didactically enriched fable texts for use in Latin and Greek classes, which you can see uh, on the screenshot I, I uh, posted in, the, in my slides. And you can uh, potentially classify it as a didactic scholarly edition of Greek and Latin fables. All resources use a Creative Commons license and are freely available online. The repository qualifies as an open educational resource which means that both content and the underlying technical structures are available to download from the website. So why did we adopt a participant-based approach? For the project, we collaborated with over 250 participants, mainly pupils in secondary schools aged 14 to 18, as well as with teachers from five different schools in Austria and Germany. The participants were involved in every step of the project from the selection of the fable text and the preparation and enrichment of the, of the resources to the testing and correction of those resources. We chose to work closely with participants in the first place for two main reasons. The first one was uh, our main aim of the project was um, to bring together basically scholars and members of the general public as a means of communicating our research and demonstrating to a larger public or larger group of pupils what philological research even is. And our second reason um, concerns the nature of the materials we were creating. Um, as a teacher myself, I can attest to the fact that in school books or, or, or ed, uh, pedagogical or, or uh, didactical editions, um, certain editorial choices cannot really be easily understood by a daily user. Sometimes when reading a Latin text with scaffolding or explanations, I and also my students sometimes wonder why certain expressions that mean no explanation are explained in detail, while other unclear words are left unexplained. So that is why we wanted the participants to create resources based on their own needs, uh, not what someone else thought they would need. So what are the benefits and challenges we were faced with uh, while conducting the project? Well, one benefit is, of course, that the resources we created were actually created by learners uh, of ancient languages who know uh, the needs of a future user of the repository maybe better than someone who has already mastered the language. So we have an, um, a, a resource by a, by a user for a user, basically. Um, a second benefit would be that uh, the output of our research was much more easily communicated. Um, we gained the impression that pupils were acted as multipliers, so to speak, um, communicating their involvement uh, to demographic groups, for example, the pupil families we would otherwise not have been able to reach. Also, by focusing on practical use in schools, we were able to reach teaching professionals in the field. A third benefit would be that we were able to show the participants what it is that we actually do when we talk about philological uh, scholarly research and to spark their interest and enthusiasm in their uh, in philological scholarship. We've been, even gotten feedback that a few of the participants now even consider uh, studying Latin or Greek uh, only because of the work they did in this project. So we consider this a, a success. Uh, to round, uh, round out or to, to conclude, I will briefly talk about the challenges. One challenge was definitely uh, logistics and communication. We worked with a lot of different people from many different institutions. So um, we, we, we summarized or we concluded that structured planning and clear and central channels of communication are essential. Uh, when, when working with, with a lot of people. And uh, another challenge was uh, working with teenagers. Not all of them are automatically experts in the field or even that interested in the first place, uh, since we work with whole classes of uh, classes and, and not all of the pupils were volunte volunteers. So uh, our challenge was to somehow in, uh, to educate and also to motivate uh, the participants accordingly to be able to use 
the unique point of view on the subject. So um, yeah, that is all for, for me. Thank you for the opportunity to present my uh, or our project. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Lucas. Uh, the following presentation is that of Manuel Villar, University of Granada. Uh, are you there, Manuel? Yes, I'm here. Ah, okay. If I can share this. I listen to you. Okay, can you see the presentation? I guess you can see, see the presentation. No problem. Okay. Okay, my name is Manuel Pilar, professor at Granada University. I want to share with you today a citizen science initiative called 74 High Mountain Oasis, which was launched in 2018 by a group of scientists and professors of the Ecology Department of Granada University in collaboration with the Global Change Observatory, the National Park of Sierra Nevada, and also the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. The purpose of this campaign is to bring science closer to citizens and involve society in the research and protection of mountains and specifically high mountain lakes, which are no doubt some of the most beautiful and threatened landscapes in Spain. You can access all the information of this citizen science campaign through the website lagunasdesierranevada.es. These 74 lakes are located in Sierra Nevada, the highest mountain range in the Iberian Peninsula from which you can easily see Africa on a clear day. These are truly unique ecosystems with very high altitudes, over 3,000 meters, and disturbed sites and very extreme conditions, uh, which serve to scientists as sentinels of global change because they allow to track and detect the early warnings of global change. But at the same time, these are really remote sites with walking access through very steep sidewalks. And this is a major handicap for scientists that have to transport very heavy scientific and sampling equipment, and sometimes with the help of mules that are not always willing to move, as you can see. It is here where the support of citizens, many of them mountaineers, is being impressive and a really great relief. We now have multidisciplinary monitoring teams made up of more than 100 volunteers, scientists, and park rangers that participate in the periodic sampling of these lakes, also in the setup of experiments, and usually in cleanup campaigns on other things. So I can truly say that this is the purpose of this campaign is twofold. On the one hand, for scientists, it is really an invaluable contribution and it allows us to gather a whole lot of data that would otherwise be unapproachable. For example, we can carry on our intensive monitoring of 45 years of data in some lakes, or last year we performed an extensive monitoring of over 50 lakes in 2020. And for the, on the other hand, for the ordinary citizen, this is a window into science, one that helps understand the science-based decisions that ensure the protection of the environment. This is a science, uh, citizen science initiative that is growing year after year. Every time more, we try to go a step farther in the commitment to citizens by, for example, building an historical photographic record of these lakes. These pictures that we receive from the citizens enable us to evaluate historical changes in land use, human impact, as well as other anthropic and natural perturbations on these lakes. A second initiative has to do with an annual photographic contest where the best pictures are awarded by over 25 private sponsors and public institutions. These are, for example, some of the best pictures that we received in last year contest. Best pictures are selected for annual photographic exhibitions. We also hold periodic annual workshops in Sierra Nevada with the participation of different stakeholders such as nature agencies, nature tourism, or environmental groups, among others. Finally, we participate in different scientific fairs and outreach activities in schools. In summary, I want to finish by saying that although this is a modest campaign, we are happy to do our bit in raising awareness on the unsustainable future facing mountains. 
But on this effort, we cannot afford not to get the general public involved into environmental issues. And I believe citizen science is a critical step as it paves the way to generating a new culture, scientific culture, one that builds a new alliance between science, society, and politics. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for the presentation. A very interesting project around here in Granada. And now we're going to listen to Massimo De Marchi, Salvatore Papalardo. Are you there? Yes, we are here. Yep. Yes, we are there. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Just a couple of words uh, before uh, uh, letting the floor to my colleague, uh, Salvatore Papalardo. We are geographers. We have a long tradition in working with people and with uh, starting with the participatory mapping at least 50 years ago. And uh, uh, now we are in the technological era of participatory GIS. In geography, we call uh, citizen science as voluntary geography or neo-geography. And uh, uh, one colleague from... Uh, um, uh, one colleague, a geographer called Muki Ackley, defined the four levels of citizen science involving citizens, from level one, in which citizens are, are considered the sensor, mm -hmm. to level four, in which citizens are uh, involved in planning and developing research. He, he, Ackley called this extreme citizen science. I think this is very important because it, it connects with the meaning of Paulo Freire of construction future with people. I let the floor to my colleague Papalardo. Thank you, Massimo. I would firstly thank uh, all the colleagues of the Media Lab of the University of Granada for uh, this wonderful initiative and for giving the opportunity to share our work. Uh, I am Salvatore Papalardo and together with uh, Massimo and other researchers from the Jean Monnet Climate Justice uh, Center of Excellence, we are, can we, we are we developed this study about uh, participatory mapping of fossil fuel impacts for climate justice. So uh, this study is part of, of our long-standing research we are carrying out in the western sector of Amazon rainforest, and specifically in the Amazon region of Ecuador, in and around the so-called Yasuni Biosphere Reserve from UNESCO. This is uh, recognized as one of the most biodiverse areas on the planet and home of uh, indigenous people, such as the Waurani people and uncontacted tribes uh, known as uh, Tagaeri Taromenani. Beside this beautiful and perhaps exotic picture of Amateur Forest, uh, in uh, Amateur region of Ecuador, since more than 15 year, 50 years, uh, oil development is uh, shaping the uh, tropical ecosystems and indigenous territories. There is a, a geographical overlap of different ways to perceive uh, and to manage natural resources. Let's see fossil fuel production on top of protected areas for biodiversity conservation and indig indigenous territories as well. So uh, a less unexplored issue related to oil production is gas flaring. Gas flaring is a non-rational industrial practices of burning gas on site where oil extraction is taking place. Beside the climate change greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane, several social environmental impacts are taking place uh, in this area. On one side, uh, degradation of uh, ecosystems. On the other side, that are not less relevant, impact on local communities, uh, especially referring to public earth. So the aims of the study are mapping all gas flowing activities in uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon region, sharing geographic knowledge and open source geotechnologies for empowerment of local communities and uh, uh, supporting local campaign for a moratorium of all gas flaring activities in the Amazon region of Ecuador. We adopt this pixel and people approach. Pixel refers to the massive use of geographical information systems and remote sensing technologies, such as uh, satellite platform and also drones. Uh, people refers to the use of these uh, geo citizens uh, to the citizen science tools uh, such as uh, participatory uh, GIS, uh, voluntary geography, and uh, participatory mapping. So we used uh, uh, open source and open access satellite data from the NOAA nighttime uh, series to identify and to discriminate gas flaring activities from what's not gas flaring activities and performing these pixel analysis. 
Therefore, we combined satellite with ground dimension and territory dimension, and we work together with local organization such as UDAPT, uh, Caritas, and other local organizations connected to local uh, communities. Uh, to perform ground truth data validation, participatory mapping, and uh, uh, to perform a participat participative cartography. We uh, selected open source uh, uh, GIS and uh, geotechnologies such as QGIS QField, and to perform the participatory mapping, we adopted the system ONA and GEO ODK. So results uh, uh, show that uh, uh, we actually identified uh, almost 300 gas flare sites uh, all over the, uh, the Ecuadorian Amato region and uh, 447 uh, flare stacks. Moreover, through spatial analysis, uh, we identified within a radius of uh, uh, two kilometers, 86 indigenous communities, 62 human settlements, and 67 primary schools. Our data were included to support uh, this moratorium of ga gas spreading activities that was presented uh, during a trial, a legal trial in the court of Quito. So our scientific data were used as evidences of the potential impact of gas flaring on local communities. Uh, one little step and a good news, in the beginning of March uh, uh, 2021, uh, a first step towards uh, uh, environmental and climate justice was done the Ecuador Cart recognized uh, these issues, uh, ordering to end all gas, gas flaring activities by oil industry in Amazon region of Ecuador. And uh, it was uh, the uh, first step uh, of joining and combining uh, scientific academy with uh, local struggles. So, uh, of course, of, uh, our data are open source and uh, are available on, on a public open web GIS made by QGIS and LeadMap. And the campaign is still going on on the field, on the territory, beyond the pandemic's time, by using ONA server and Geo ODK. Thanks for uh, paying attention. If you are interested uh, in further information, please feel free to contact us at the references below this slide. Uh, thank you uh, for the presentation, uh, Massimo and Salvatore. Um, we now continue uh, with uh, University of Graz, uh, with uh, Peter Scherer. Uh, Peter, are you there? I'm here. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Yes, thank you very much. So we, uh, to be very short because time is running, we have uh, a very long-term project running for nearly 50 years, uh, um, um, sharing archeological findings uh, made by private uh, prospectors and collectors in, let's say, the gray zone between legacy and illegacy uh, and, to, and to make them items of uh, research work. Uh, all of you know that archaeology started around 150 years ago uh, and becoming an academic uh, um, uh, research area when Heinrich Schliemann, as a German merchant, uh, made his excavations in Troy. But since uh, these times in the, in the 19th century, much has happened and archaeology after the Second World War became more or less a mere academic uh, area and private persons were more or less excluded. So a lot of findings, a lot of knowledge uh, got lost, which in former days was brought in by private persons uh, in um, the, the cultural heritage uh, level. So in, in 1973, the Austrian Society of Archaeology was founded. And since 2002, I am the chairperson of this. And they founded a journal um, coming out uh, every year with one volume, Römisches Österreich, Roman Austria. 
Uh, and uh, this journal is not only financed mostly by the members of the society, that means it doesn't cost anything to the public, but it's uh, private uh, finance. Uh, it's also published, the articles are partly published by non-professional archaeologists. Uh, and uh, so their private collections go by these journal or by monographs on special uh, items and, and subjects into a research area. Uh, in the moment, we have about 200 private persons as members and more than 200 uh, public libraries, uh, mostly of universities, uh, who uh, have um, um, an abonnement of, of this journal. And this year, we start going open access online with the uh, Römisches Österreich um, and our um, monograph volumes as well. In the course of the next month, we hope to make available more than 50 volumes uh, for worldwide for free. The idea of 1971, uh, two years before the official founding of the Society of Archaeology, was to bring together private prospectors and collectors, and they bring their material to professional archaeologists or historians so that they can publish. In the meantime, I think I have already uh, showed, uh, talked about it, we have a new idea. Uh, developed the uh, idea is to make these private collectors um, able to publish their finds themselves with the help of professionals. So this is the declaration uh, in the very beginning of, of our society. Uh, and I just want to give uh, one short example how important this is in uh, the mountain area of southern Lower Austria, uh, about 10 years ago, private collectors and prospectors found a lot of, of uh, material of Roman times in an area which was up to this point uh, not known that there was any inhabitation or, or any activity in antiquity. And uh, after we published uh, some of what they collected, uh, mostly tools uh, and, and coins uh, and, and, and other small findings, uh, we made a project financed by the Austrian Science Fund. And now we are quite sure that uh, here is uh, one of the most important find spots of uh, Roman activity in this area, a gold mine, which we have looked for about 80 years and nobody could uh, local, uh, localize this uh, gold mine, which is reported in the ancient literature. Now we have it and we don't have only the locality, we also actually have gold and the gold washing is done by a mixed group of archeologists, students, and private uh, amateurs. Uh, so it means uh, that 100 years after Heinrich Schliemann and other uh, dilettanti uh, of Great Britain and Germany, we try to go back to a combined research work between the broad public, between private persons, and make them proud of their finds instead of bringing them to illegal. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation, Peter. Now um, we go, we're going to listen to Robert Brodschneider from the University of Graz. Robert. Hello, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yeah, we can see them. I hope they are in presentation mode. So good morning to everyone. Um, I'm Robert Brutschner. I'm from the University of Graz. I'm a biologist. And my study animal is the honeybee. And of course, you know how important the honeybee is. And the honeybee interacts also with the environment. So if we study the honeybees, we also study the environment. And happily enough, honeybees are managed by beekeepers. 
So we have support of many, many amateurs that are professionals in what they are doing in beekeeping, but they can help us really much in science. And I want to give you some examples on this today. For example, um, the first study we conducted was a European-wide study. I'm going to show you only the results from Austria. Uh, it was a citizen science supported study on the seasonal diversity and monoflorality of pollen collected by honeybees in Austria. In 2014 and 15, we had um, citizen scientists collecting um, pollen samples every two or three weeks on these very different locations in Austria, as you can see here. They preserved the samples themselves by drying them, send it to us for laboratory analysis, and actually we could then uh, investigate, for example, uh, the diversity index of the food that the pollen food that bees are consuming over the course of a season, and we could identify some uh, situations where there was a very diverse pollen diet. And I can tell you this is very good for the bee because the bee is also very healthy if they eat very different food stuff. In contrast, we also identified some situations where there was not a very good um, diversity for the honeybees. This led to another project, which is called Insignia and is funded by the European Union. We are actually at the moment finishing this project, so I'm not gonna show you some results here. Just to give you an idea, this is uh, nine European countries where 81 citizen scientists helped in first of all, developing the methodology to go really into a big analysis to, to an area-wide analysis. And uh, in this project, again, the beekeepers are collecting pollen samples, but also we are collecting another sample which allows us to identify, for example, the pesticides that the bees are in contact with. And in course of this project, the Insignia project, we also very recently published this article. So you can see we are equipping the beekeepers with the basic stuffs that they need for, the present, uh, for, the, for their sampling. The beekeepers usually have own pollen traps and on the top of this picture, you can see such a pollen trap. So this pollen is brought in by the bees. This represents what is going on in the environment. The citizen scientists are sampling this and sending it to us again for analysis. And we also ask the beekeepers in this project what's very difficult for them and what is very easy for them. And overall the rating uh, of maximum 10, which is very hard, we can see that most of the things that we ask the beekeepers to participate as citizen scientists are rated as really simple. And of course, we also investigated uh, their motivation. So why are they um, participating as citizen scientists in our projects. And that's very similar to what we find in other uh, literature sources on sci sci uh, citizen scientist motivation. They want to contribute to scientific knowledge or enhance the environment. And one thing, uh, they want to receive free laboratory analysis of their samples is only ranked in the middle. But when we speak about the the recognition, the appreciation of their participation, this is very highly ranked. So the beekeepers are really interested in um, receiving results on their own environment and on their own bees. One last slide. This is a really long uh, ongoing project. Um, I started it uh, together with uh, Professor Kreilsheim at the University of Graz in 2008. We are asking beekeepers how did their honeybee colonies over winter, how many colonies did they have, what did they feed, what kind of treatments did they apply. And since 14 years now, we are collecting data on the colony loss rate of honeybee colonies in Austria. And also here, you can see uh, one of the latest um, publications originating from this. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm gonna post in the links to the articles that I mentioned to the chat. Thank you, Robert. Now we're going to listen to Rosana Montes from here from Granada. Rosana? Sí. Yeah. Okay.
se va a callar porque si no... Hello, everyone. I'm Rosana Montes from the University of Granada and the Andalusian Research Institute in Data Science and Computational Intelligence. And I'm here to present you Monomai, which is a citizen science project of the Discovery Foundation and the University of Granada that offers the opportunity to approach for all people the artistic styles of cultural heritage. Monomai combines monuments, mathematics, and artificial intelligence. We intend together with citizen researchers to provide the best artificial intelligence algorithms in arts. And for that, we need to super train our software. It is developed based on automatic learning, also known as deep learning. People particip participate by uploading photos from the mobile, but also by giving feedback about the resulting processed image. For that communication, we use an app as, as a tool between citizens and our AI model that is hosted on the cloud. This app is freely available on Android and iOS. And with Monomai, we, you can learn about art, but also about mathematics and proportion, which is the relative dimension that can be presented in arts, windows, vertex, and so on. That also they can contribute to the training of our intelligent models. The more photos loaded to the server, the greater the chances for the deep learning algorithms to continuously learn and improve itself, minimizing error. The knowledge and enjoyment of historical and cultural heritage is one of the fundamental values of our society. We wanted to involve citizens in this challenge of automatically identify that contextual style, but we also want to do science with social objectives. We want to contribute to the social awareness of the importance of architectural heritage. We want to elaborate an open and collaborative map that can be extended with more information of the monument. We want the app to be also a resource for su uh, that support educational activities and we can integrate all this knowledge into other experience as Monomai could be also a resources for scientific students. What we have achieved in this project is the automatic recognition of architectural style from pictures of monument. The artificial model sees many of the architectural elements that you will also see on a facade or even is able to detect elements that you will miss. This will work as long as the photograph is of good quality, well framed and well lit. But for us, the citizen is not just a data provide. They can learn or even remember what we already know about these visual elements that are related to the style Baroque, Gothic, Hispano-Islamic, and Renaissance. And we have found that it's work also when these mixes are, so sorry, this style are the mixes on the same facade. Well, what, uh, by now we are about more than 2000 profile register, more than 8,000 image processes, and the algorithm recognized 15 different architectural elements related to these four style. This is the part that uh, we can extend the model but by recognizing more elements of the same style or by incorporating the element of a new style such as neo-renaissance. We have a survey in the app and in the website to study uh, the, the proportion. We want to find out what is the most beautiful mathematical proportion. Perhaps in these days is more uh, this technological radius than the, the well-known golden radio, for instance. We do have the open database and all the technical the deep learning model published in the journal Neurocomputing. And well, I finish here. The team of University of Granada, as well as the Discovery Foundation, encouraged you to visit the website to download the application, to check the gallery with the 
uh, artificial intelligence processes image tied, tagged by element and style because it's helped to, to review concepts related to architectural style. We all can uh, learn. <laughs> well, thank you in advance for using and, propon um, and promoting Monomai and for this opportunity to share our project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon Fari uh, will not be present uh, because he is unwell. Uh, now let's go to uh, Valentina De Gen, uh, University of uh, Vilnius. Hey, hello, everybody. But I need to share my slides, so please stop. I'm trying. Yeah, because I, I, I couldn't. On the top should be like uh, stop sharing. I cannot see the bottom. I'm trying to, to get back. <laughs> Sorry. So maybe organizers can stop because I do not have these rights to stop you, your slides. No, I'm not able to stop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the other window. Sorry. Oh, uh, yes. Thanks, yeah. you. No. So, okay. So I'm the last, the last speaker and everybody I think is very tired and uh, so that I will try as fast as soon as I can. So do you see my slides? Yes. Hey. Yes, you should. Okay, so now I, I, will, I would like to present uh, one project that we have at Vilnius University from hundreds of projects, but it is very, it calls meaningful, uh, most meaningful open schooling connects schools to communities. And uh, this is very, very prestige project is from uh, Horizon 2020, but it, but it is because it's try to connect schools, communities, uh, uh, universities, researchers. It means that to and and to promote this uh, experiments and involve citizens and also to focus on et ecological projects. As you see, there is two strands. One is open schooling communities across Europe, and another trend is European open schooling networks that we promised to establish. Pro project started just uh, uh, last year in autumn, so that we are in the um, just in 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 uh, doing uh, imp implementing, and the project will end in 2023. So maybe this picture explain you better that how schools will be connected with uh, community members and uh, with other. Uh, with stakeholders and the uh, universities. So this is a big project with 22 partners from 10 countries. And the main uh, activity is to encourage schools to develop different projects, uh, school projects, focus on different uh, uh, problems that it's uh, important for community, important for uh, for uh, school and and uh, to involve parents, to involve um, uh, grandparents, uh, researchers, and uh, associations. What what are around schools? So the and uh, we are going to make uh, many uh, this uh, project fairs to then to um, discuss about examples and to share our uh, experience and so that you see how many there is uh, networks and we are going also to share our experience with uh, uh, other European countries and uh, so that is link that I will can put in chat as well but it is uh, uh, easy if you just google most and European open schooling network you can get the uh, get about this project and uh, probably if you would like, if you are interested, uh, we can make projects with uh, any of your country school. Thanks you. So I finished. Thank you very much, Valentina. And thanks to all the speakers that have now finished the first act of today's session.
Um, I invite you to stay for the rest of the activities. They're going to be very interesting. And um, now we're going to have a 10 minute break. Okay, so you can eat or drink something if you need. After that, uh, we will assign you to different breakout rooms in which you will have your work groups. Uh, you will be assigned different topics and you will be able to talk to each other about the topics and share your uh, past experiences and maybe develop new proposals uh, in cooperation. These rooms will last for 50 minutes and with all the information that you come up, your new proposals will be shown to the rest of the speakers and the rest of the groups at the end of today's session. If you have uh, any questions, you can let us know. But now we're going to start the 10 minute break. So see you in a bit. So is everybody back? Shall we start with presentations? Uh, well, we return to the session. Um, they are going to present us some conclusion. Uh, group A, topic one. The topic is how to ensure data quality in citizen science project. Um, are you there, uh, group, uh, group uh, A, topic one? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yes. I was. Hello, my name is Daniela. I was cho chosen to uh, to show you what we what we brainstormed. Um, so we thought that the, the most important thing regarding the data quality is to uh, ensure that the that the quality of data is the same as in any other research project, and therefore um, researchers have the the responsibility to guide the citizens through the whole project. So we thought that the, even before the project starts, uh, researchers should teach the basics um, of research um, to provide information and um, give information to questions like what is research about and what is the general goal and what are the ethical principles? And then of course, what is data? How can one deal with data? and how um, data can be collected. And uh, then we thought that it's also important to find a framework for, um, for communication and then train citizens um, and, and to, to provide them um, guidance along the whole project. Um, we also mentioned that uh, methodology should be uh, applica applic applicable for everyone. And um, then let me see what, what else we had. Um, another important point is the handling of data. Um, for example, um, the, the transformation from uh, analog data to digital data and to uh, make the process, uh, the whole process as easy as possible for everyone. And um, yeah, so I think that was the, the or they were the, the most important points. Um, so to conclude, I think uh, it's about the responsibility from the researchers. They act as experts, of course, and they should give or they should provide the, the information citizens need how to deal with the data in a, in, the, in a correct way. Maybe some of, of my, my, my team colleagues want to add something or was that everything? It was perfect, Daniela. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniela. Uh, maybe, maybe one small addition. Uh, we also uh, suggest maybe to set up uh, some indicators for quality. So what is high quality data in concern of your project? And um, maybe uh, to assign um, or to give citizens more responsibility during the project so that they can 
um, adopt some kind of uh, researcher um, identity and therefore um, perceive the importance of high quality, like uh, when they are um, more responsible, they have more engagement and they maybe are more interested in high quality as well. So this was from our group. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the conclusion. And uh, now uh, they are going to present their experience to us. Uh, group A, topic three. The topic is uh, the role of citizens in citizen science project. Mm -hmm. uh, group A, topic three. Yeah. Yeah, we are here. So um, we were two in our group, uh, Jane and uh, Jane Scarrow and myself. So I will present uh, on behalf of our of our team. Um, well, we we talked about that uh, citizens are um, at the core of citizen science projects. Um, they're enabled to collect uh, large scale data that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, uh, our, however, the focus in, in our discussion was also on capacity building uh, to ensure engagement and good quality data. Um, then uh, we, <clears throat> we emphasize that still what one often sees in, in, in citizen science projects is, is that citizens are in the role of data collectors only. And so we emphasize that there is a need to include citizens in all phases of a project as co-researchers. So starting uh, involving citizens already when it comes to the choice of the research topic, uh, then when it comes to the choice of uh, methods, uh, but also involving them in data analysis and uh, interpre interpreting and presenting the results. And uh, that leads us to uh, to uh, one, one sentence that we really liked a lot um, that was uh, that, uh, said by one of the speakers this morning that said uh, life questions, uh, yeah, how to, you know, we should put life questions into citizens, into science research questions. So really to, uh, to choose topics for citizen science projects that actually matters for citizens. And that uh, brings, uh, brought us to a second uh, next topic that was uh, motivation. So uh, we were um, uh, brainstorming of the importance of the tools and the means that one chooses in order to motivate uh, citizens. And there's uh, scientists should think about media, about uh, the role of digitalization, but also about what kind of, of message uh, you would like to bring out in order to, uh, to get your, your citizens. And so that, is, um, yeah, that brings us to the question like how also to engage marginal groups or maybe how to engage citizens that, that wouldn't have a naturally attraction to science or, or, or to research. And so quickly we came to the role of schools as a, as a lever uh, to, uh, yeah, to, to engage um, citizens. Um, and also the importance of using hands-on events, creative, uh, creative events to encourage youth and, and elderly people, for instance, um, working with film festivals or working with uh, photography or photo voice or storytelling events, uh, science festivals, science fairs, in order to, uh, yeah, to, to really attract citizens and um, at large in, 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 uh, with diverse um, backgrounds. So motivation, motivation was one topic and linked to it is another topic, namely acknowledgement. How do we acknowledge adequately the contribution and the inputs that the citizens uh, provide to a project? And um, we found it an interesting um, uh, input from one of the speakers this morning who taught about citizens publishing their own findings. And uh, another um, um, need or yeah, another idea could be also to um, mention NGOs, for instance, as co-authors of, of publications, or if you have a small group of citizens, uh, to, to mention them also as, as co-authors, but uh, to acknowledge them prob probably. And uh, a last point was funding. Um, we found that one spends, as a, as a researcher, a lot of time in, uh, um, in establishing uh, trust and a good relationship with citizens. 
uh, before a project actually starts and also after the project ends. However, funding organizations um, only very rarely acknowledge that. And so uh, we saw a big need uh, for funding organizations uh, at EU level, but also at national level to provide seed funding and follow up funding uh, for citizen science projects. Yeah, so that is uh, how far we came in our discussion. Um, Jane, I don't know if you'd like to, to add something, something that I left out or I oversaw. No, I, I think that was a, a great summary of what we talked about, Aletta. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I give back to co organizers. Thanks for sharing um, with us. Uh, we ended with uh, Esteban's intervention, uh, director of Media Lab. Esteban. Uh, hi all. Uh, thank you for this wonderful morning um, in Spain. We say that uh, when we finish on time, is that we are keeping uh, European times. So I don't know if it works the same in in your countries probably not but um, i think that in this case we are even saving some minutes and it's not bad because it was a very uh, intense uh, morning i think that this was very useful for our initiative on citizen science at the arcus um, alliance and i'm sure that it give us uh, new energy you know to continue building uh, this network of universities that at the end is just a network of people that need to meet each other and to and to create projects in common so i i hope that this is that, that this uh, event contributed to to this um and that's all basically thank you and i would like also to to ask hildrun to to say some some works some words before we finish um, um, and see you next time. Thank you, Esteban. Yeah, many thanks uh, on behalf of the Openness Task Force for, for being with us today. Uh, many thanks to all the interesting talks today. I learned a lot and I'm very happy to have you all here and I I would be even more happy to see you soon uh, in during a project, maybe a joint project. And um, if you have still some ideas on our living lab topics, please uh, share them with us. Uh, this will go into our position paper on open science and citizen science and uh, uh, how to further um, citizen science within our European University Alliance. So uh, there will be a future for our ideas. And um, thank you very much for sharing and for being with us and being so active today. So thank you very much and see you soon. <laughs> So thank you and we already finished this this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Bye. thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.